live. Uh, thank you. Welcome. We're, I'd like to call to order the February 14, 2022 meeting of the Development and Operations Services Standing Committee for the Town of Collingwood. I'm going to start by reading out the land acknowledgement. For more than 15,000 years, the First Nations walked upon and cared for the lands we now call home. Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe, and many others who cared for their families and communities the way we now seek to care for ours. The Town of Collingwood acknowledges the late Simcoe Nottawasaga Treaty of 1818 and respects all of the nation to nation agreements that have formed relationships with the original inhabitants of Turtle Island. We acknowledge the reality of our shared history, the current contributions of Indigenous people within our community and seek to continuing to continue empowering expressions of pride amongst all of the diverse stakeholders in this area. We seek to do better, to continue to recognize, learn and grow in friendship and community nation to nation. I'd like to uh, now move to the adoption of the agenda that the content of the Development and Operations Service Standing Committee agenda for February 14, 2022 be adopted as presented. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Jeffrey, Councillor Doherty, thank you. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your, oh, yes, sorry, uh, Deputy Clerk Dahl. Uh, thank you, Chair Hamlin. Uh, sorry, uh, I was wondering if we could potentially move up item 8.1 to uh, just after the election so our committee members can uh, have their night after they make their presentations. Absolutely. Thank you for mentioning that. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, with that amendment in mind, uh, all those in favor. And that's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, so if any of these members of the standing committee have a uh, declaration of pecuniary interest they'd like to make, please mention it now. And if not, if you find yourself in that position during the meeting, uh, please announce it at that time. Seeing none. So first real item on the agenda is the election of a chair and vice chair for the 2022 year. And so now I turn it over to Deputy Clerk Dahl for that. Uh, thank you, Chair Hamlin. So as per our procedural bylaw, um, each year we look for a, uh, the election of a chair and vice chair for our standing committees. Um, so I'll provide a brief overview of the election process before we start. And uh, the first item will be calling for nominations. A member may nominate another member or themselves, and a nomination does not require to be seconded. Um, I will continue to call for nominations until no further nominations are put on the floor and will confirm with each nominee if they wish to have their name stand. Um, I will then ask each nominee in order of the nomination to provide a brief explanation of why they're interested in the position of chair or vice chair. After each nominee has spoken, I will call for a vote for the nominees based on order of nomination. Uh, the first member receiving majority vote will be elected to the position. And if only one member is nominated and the nominee accepts the nomination, the individual will be uh, claimed to the position and no vote is required. Uh, so we will start with the uh, position of chair. Uh, so we'll now ask the question, are there any nominations for the position of chair for the Development Operations Services Standing Committee? And uh, Mayor Saunderson. Uh, yes, thank you, Deputy Clerk. Uh, and, and I just wanted to start off by saying um, uh, I want to commend and thank each of uh, my colleagues uh, who have served as chair for one year. I think they've all done exceptional jobs. And uh, this is a, a committee where we do a fair bit of heavy lifting. And uh, so I wanted to congratulate each. I do note that um, uh, we have sort of gone in rotation, starting with Councillor Jeffrey first year, Councillor Doherty second year, and Councillor Hammond third year. So I'm proposing to uh, nominate Councillor Jeffrey as it's really come full circle in terms of the, each serving a year and uh, so propose that she would be chair uh, moving forward for this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Saunderson and Councillor Jeffrey, do you accept this nomination? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, uh, so I'll call for a second time for nominations. Are there any more nominations for the position of chair? Councillor Hamlin. Uh, thank you. I'd like to nominate Councillor Doherty for position of chair. Okay. And Councillor Doherty, do you accept this nomination? I do. Okay. Thank you. And I'll call for the third time. Are there any other nominations for the position of chair? 
All right, so I'll close the nominations and I'll uh, let Councillor Jeffrey speak first if you want to address the committee. Uh, thank you uh, through you, Deputy Clerk. I just, um, I would really like to get back into um, uh, facilitating the meetings as chair. I have uh, quite a bit of experience and I think we have a lot of major items that we're trying to um, fit into our term and make sure that uh, we have in a good place for the next term. And um, I would just welcome the opportunity to uh, provide that leadership. So, and I'm, I enjoy working with everybody. So thank you. And Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you, uh, colleagues. Um, so I offer you my previous experience as chair and also uh, my own style of leadership uh, to put forward into this position. Um, I uh, commit to you um, that I uh, will foster a meeting environment of respect, open mindedness and teamwork not only among ourselves here at this table, but among ourselves and staff and among ourselves and our public. And finally, and similar to Councillor Jeffrey, I, I have done this before. Uh, I am very familiar with the uh, procedural bylaw. Uh, I uh, would embrace the opportunity to uh, have this, uh, um, to be nominated to chair again. Uh, and um, I uh, um, am willing and able to make the commitment to the time and the effort that it is required to be chair of this sometimes onerous committee. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, so with uh, that said, I will call for the first vote um, that Councillor Jeffrey hereby be appointed as chair to the Development Operations Service Standing Committee. And all those in favor, please raise your yes cards. And all those opposed, please raise your no cards. Okay, so with a tie vote, that is defeated. So we will move on to the next nomination. Uh, so I'll call the question. All those um, that Councillor Doherty be hereby appointed as chair to the Development Operations Services Standing Committee. All those in favor, please raise your yes cards. And all those opposed, please raise your no cards. All right, so both nominations were, can't, were, were defeated. <laughs> so um, I can either call the, to the floor for further nominations or we can postpone the, the election of chair until we have five members present, which will hopefully be in March. Uh, thank you, Deputy Clerk Dahl. Uh, I guess my thought would be it would be helpful, and I see you, uh, I'll uh, get to you, uh, Mayor Saunders, in a minute. Uh, my thought would be it might be helpful to wait until there's five members present, and then the vote won't be tied, and we'll have all members of the committee here, because uh, I think that's who's best to decide this, is our committee, uh, having sat on this now for three years. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Saunders, did you wish to address that? Uh, I, I'm content with that. We have our deputy mayor coming back to council on uh, February 28th, so we can uh, put this over until the March uh, committee meeting. Okay. Uh, with that said, does the committee want to move forward with vice chair appointment, or would you prefer to also defer that uh, to happen at the same meeting? I think it would be good to defer that as well. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I would be in agreement with that. Yeah. All right. I will turn it over to Chair Hamlin. Thank you. So I'll continue chairing this meeting. Uh, so the next item would be 8.1. Uh, thank you, Chair Hamlin. I believe there's a PowerPoint presentation that will bring up on the screen. And just while we're waiting, I'd like to give a big call out and thank you to all of our volunteers that sit on our committee and boards. They play such an important role in our governance of our municipality, providing um, much admired advice to council uh, when making decisions uh, within their mandate. Next slide, Stephanie. 
Uh, so the reason why we're bringing forward this report uh, for you today is to bring some recognition to our committees and boards that uh, work very hard in the background and as part of our uh, community-based strategic plan goal in transparency and accountable local government and enhancing public trust. So one of the actions in this plan is to provide an annual public report to council from all boards, committees and committees um, in which the town has an interest, including their priorities for next year and accomplishments related to the town strategic plan. So the, the uh, committees that report into Development and Operation Services Standing Committee are Collingwood Heritage Committee and our Committee of Adjustment and Property Standards Committee. In 2021, boards and committees fully adapted to virtual meetings and met on a regular basis. And notwithstanding the challenges faced by COVID-19, our committees and boards members work diligently and maintain a positive, enthusiastic attitude to accomplish their respective priorities set out in 2001 or 2021. Sorry. Excellent. So now I'll pass it over to the chair of the uh, Collingwood Heritage Committee, and that it would be Kathy Geruder. So Stephanie, if we can let Kathy in. And Kathy, you'll have to unmute and I, show yeah, your video. I think, <laughs> okay, I'm, okay, am I here? We can hear you, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Um, I became the chair of the Heritage Committee um, in, uh, I believe it was June of 2021. So I only have six months under my belt, but um, as you may know, I had some background in, uh, in regards to the committee as a, a staff, uh, former staff member. So of the accomplishments there, uh, I think we can be very proud of what we did under the circumstances. Um, and uh, we're continuing to do those things, basically. Uh, some of the things that we did accomplish uh, were driven largely by the volunteer um, members of the committee themselves. Uh, as an example, the um, photo inventory, Heritage Week, uh, and uh, the awards uh, and the, uh, uh, we have one of our members was a, a member of the modernization committee. So they have, uh, the, the committee members have really stepped up and, um, and uh, buckled down to some of the work that can be involved. Um, if, I think we were ready to go on to the next slide, please, Stephanie. Thank you. So there's where I come into um, our what we're coming wanting to accomplish in 2022. I do want to start off by saying that I found this piece on the uh, Ontario Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Cultural Industries website, and it says how committees and councils can work together. Now this I'm just reading, volunteers who serve on a heritage committee are directly involved in making decisions that affect their community. Committees are not, however, autonomous. They are established by a municipal bylaw and can only exercise the authority granted to them by council. All final decisions rest with council. And I just wanted to throw that out there as a bit of a reminder, um, maybe more to the general public, um, that we're basically, um, we make recommendations on the committee level. However, it's council who has uh, the uh, power uh, behind any of those recommendations to either accept them or reject them. But we do have a few um, challenges, I guess, uh, as in you hear from many of the committees and, and the general public. But one of our, our, our challenges is that the staffing level for heritage committee uh, resource um, staff has gone from three part-time people to down to one. And however, the one person doesn't do uh, the job full-time. They have many, many other um, duties and, and uh, so have limited time to spend on heritage matters. So that, that's the reason why some of the uh, committee members have stepped up to take on some of the, of the roles. 
but many of the roles we can't step up and take and take over because they're regarding um, things to do with the Heritage Act. So that requires a staff person to do them. So what there, I'd like to go over a few of the little things that some of the things that we've been wanting to do. Um, as an example, the Heritage website hasn't been updated since 2017. And we had that as a priority item for this year, as you see. Um, but we've already been, it's our, we've already been notified that that's not going to happen in 2022 uh, because of staffing. Um, there's been a, a number of other things that have been having to sort of slide to the back burner. Um, we do have one new designation coming up very shortly that I know you're aware of already, but we have two more. And people have been waiting to uh, have their properties designated, but there again takes staff time. Um, another one is the heritage grants. We'd very much like to update the um, heritage grants. As you know, it has it became uh, into play in 20, 2006. And at, at that time, there's a $3,000 grant available uh, for a, uh, if you're doing a $6,000. Um, renovation or addition or not addition, but uh, restoration of some nature. But $3,000 in today's money doesn't go as far as it did um, even in 2006. So we very much like to update that. However, also takes time, uh, staff time. Uh, a new item that we're wanting to um, update or if not update, we don't have one, is emergency preparedness. And this has come um, to light via the, God, the situation in Godrich in 2011 when the, the uh, tornado hit it. Um, so this is a program that would help protect our heritage, our built heritage uh, resources um, in the way that if there was an emergency, either be uh, like, heaven forbid, a tornado or a, or a fire or some other disaster, even a car banging into a heritage building, we would have a response ready for that type of um, situation, wherein involving obviously the uh, chief building official, and if he or she were to declare a unsafe building order on a building, then we would have a procedure set in what happens next. Unfortunately, in the, in the case of Godrich, many um, of their heritage resources were demolished before um, any um, input from anybody in the heritage professionals, such as engineers and architects and, and cons conservationists. So I don't want anything like that to happen in Collingwood. So <laughs> I'd like to ex explore that. Um, however, also takes staff time. Um, the heritage newsletter, um, We've had Laura Lane Moore doing our staff, our heritage newsletter for us. And in the past, it had been directly mailed to every owner of a designated building. Uh, so that was the way we got out our, our information about the programs, about what's required, what permitting is necessary, all of those very important things. Um, however, um, Laurel has decided to retire from that position, having done it for many years. So now we need to find and recruit a new, a new person for that. And, um, but now it requires a lot of staff time in, because we have to go through all the procurement bylaw to get a new person. So that would be another priority because uh, we don't, we're running out of uh, ways to communicate with the building um, owners because without a newsletter, without a website that's, um, um, updated. Uh, we do have the town page uh, left. So we do have one source of media that I can think of that uh, we're still able to get out communications out to. But um, these other two items, I think, are, are need to be a priority as well. The other thing is the terminals. Um, obviously, we're very, very interested in it, in the terminals and what's going to be happening with the terminals. Um, to this point, um, the Heritage Committee as a committee has not been invited to any of the uh, sessions or 
anything for the uh, what's going to be coming up. So I hope that you do keep that in mind as we go forward. Uh, we're all very, very interested in it. Well, thankfully, uh, Margaret Moy has uh, uh, been keeping us updated as to what's been going on that, that she's been involved with. But uh, there's uh, lots going on and, and uh, we do are very, very interested and do want to be involved in the, in the um, information that comes forward. So that's my rant. <laughs> I wonder if there's any questions. Uh, would there be any, uh, let me just see here. Would there be any comments or questions from the public before I turn to the committee members? Thank you, Chair Hamlin. If there's anyone from the public that which is, wishes to address the Heritage Committee's presentation, please press the raise your hand feature. And I don't see anyone interested in speaking to this item at this time. Okay, I'll read in the recommendation then to get it on the, well, I guess I won't. It's a bit complicated. Are we having another report, um, Deputy Clerk Dahl? Uh, yes, Chair Hamlin. I have Joanne Bowden here from the uh, Committee of Adjustment. Okay, so perhaps now would be appropriate to ask the committee members for questions of Mr. Ruder. Yeah, Council uh, I think Councillor Doherty was first and then Councillor Jeffrey. Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you very much, um, Kathy, for that update. Uh, you know, it's uh, we see as uh, council members the month by month uh, reports on committee meetings, but it's really good to see a summary of all that has been done uh, in the past 12 months, uh, just to get a sense of just how very effective our committees are, not just Heritage, uh, but all of our uh, committees. Uh, so congratulations. Um, and I'm very glad that you mentioned uh, the notion of um, staff resources uh, with Heritage because um, it has been mentioned to me previously. And, and then when I, when I thought about it, um, uh, when I was on council uh, other terms, uh, we did have uh, resources like Ron Martin, uh, who was a uh, staff uh, building official and a uh, heritage specialist from a building standpoint and how terrific it would be to have a person like that uh, on the heritage committee. Um, so uh, certainly it's not something that we can consider today but um, it, it, if we do want to see our heritage preserved, then it makes a lot of sense to me um, that uh, we need to provide this committee with the resources to do it. Um, just one other, I have a question, and I think probably the best person to direct this to would be the CAO. Um, and um, that is uh, the mention of the Heritage Newsletter and um, the fact that there is uh, no one to do that. And I'm just wondering if that might fall under the communications portfolio, uh, even if the Heritage members were to provide content that our communications personnel could uh, put something together. And so through you to CAO Skinner. Go ahead, CAO. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair, uh, to Councillor Doherty. Uh, yes, there's a couple of things underway as council members, I, I know are aware because each one has been uh, interviewed about our uh, strategic plan or strategic intentions for communications. Uh, we are looking at the overall umbrella and uh, tying that umbrella together and potentially adding a resource if uh, the, the plan is sufficient. So I, I think whether um, the, the, um, uh, the actual writing is carried out by our communications resources or they're coordinating that writing, it would depend on, on the resources available, but definitely it's something that, uh, that is, needs to be within our suite of communications um, with respect to heritage properties. 
Um, another thing I'll just mention briefly, um, and this is a more of a one-time piece, but we've also been updating our material for new homeowners. Uh, so if somebody's moved into the Heritage District or into a Heritage Home, so they'd get more explicit communication about um, uh, their, uh, uh, their property and, and some of the programs they have access to, for example. Uh, so yes, uh, thank you for mentioning that. And I will also mention it to communications if and I they may be watching this now as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any follow up, Councillor Doherty? No, that's terrific. And uh, just a, one other comment, and that is that um, uh, it does make sense uh, for us to include a representative of the Heritage Committee in our uh, future discussions with regards to the terminals. Uh, so I hope that we can uh, all take that under advisement uh, as we as we go as we proceed on that journey. Thank you. And those those are all my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would concur with most of um, Councillor Doherty's comments, and I had a bit of angst at listening to. Um, Chair Kathy um, outline because I, I got this angst that other than some very basic responsibilities and their recommendations, the, the, the future planning or strategic planning for heritage as a unit has um, has become stale, made it. It's just not moving forward at all. And, and we, the expertise that we have available to us on that committee, we should be using. So. I'm not sure what the solution is, and it may be when we do get to have the item on the floor that I may ask staff if this is a budget discussion, if this is, um, I mean, I don't know where the previous resources we had for Heritage got reallocated or how that happened, but even a staff report on how we can bolster this committee's work because it is important work. So really no questions for the committee. I think they're doing outstanding work and um, bearing being very responsible and um, honest with uh, going forward what they they need to do their job uh, in making their recommendations to us. So um, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much. Mayor Saunderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you uh, to Chair DeRuder for the presentation today. Uh, certainly a busy agenda. I'm just wondering, though, on the input on the grain terminals, I know we had a heritage assessment done of the grain terminals, and, uh, and it does come through committee. And so uh, through you to uh, Deputy Clerk Dahl, uh, would it be appropriate for the committee to come and uh, uh, speak to council uh, through the committee process? Um, we did hear from Margaret Mui at uh, the last meeting about the grain terminals, and I'm just wondering if there's any reason that a committee uh, could not come and provide comments uh, at, uh, at uh, the committee, our committee, our standing committee. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson, through the chair. Um, I would like to discuss it further with the staff that's responsible for this uh, project, but um, a committee is always welcome to come to their standing committee to discuss any item. Um, so I, I understand that the terminal report went to SIC. Uh, we could provide that communication to them and uh, potentially an update at the committee on where that uh, project stands. Thank you very much, Deputy Clerk. I seems to me that uh, it would be very appropriate to uh, have our uh, heritage committee speaking to uh, something as strategic and as important to our community as the green terminals. So um, if that is a mechanism that's already in place, and I would certainly hope that uh, the committee could take advantage of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, was there any follow up, uh, Mayor Saunderson? Okay, I uh, also just want to echo the comments and say thank you to Ms. DeRuder for coming here and uh, giving us an update and also taking the time to explain how the committee work could be improved. Uh, because if you don't come and tell us, we just you know don't have the same ability to find out what's going on. It's so helpful. Um, I do have a question uh, for Director Valentine. Uh, I, is staff currently preparing a report uh, concerning the Heritage Committee, uh, and if they are, what is it directed to? Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, following a recent resolution of uh, this committee and council, staff are preparing a report regarding the ability to issue stop work orders when there is uh, um, a heritage infraction and to be more clear with our communication it, uh, with homeowners and uh, business owners in the heritage district. We also committed as part of that report to provide a high level overview of uh, resourcing and potential other next steps to improve our, all, over, our overall heritage committee programming. And certainly the comments uh, shared today by the chair of that committee are quite helpful. Uh, we do have community planner Tickle, who is dedicated in part uh, to that to being the main staff link of that committee. And I don't think anyone on this call would uh, dispute when I say he's doing an exemplary job in executing those core duties, but he is at the end of the day, one individual with a number of other responsibilities. So I do think uh, Madam Chair that that report would provide a good opportunity or springboard should this committee wish to discuss uh, the larger future of the heritage programming, the resources that might be required and take a more strategic look at perhaps the growth and maintenance of that portfolio. Thank you so much for that. Uh, sorry, am I still muted? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for that answer. I was hoping that was what you were going to say. Do you have any uh, sense yet? And I know the scheduling is always busy, but when that report might be coming back to this committee? Thank you again, Madam Chair. And uh, the target was March and uh, March or potentially April, I'll say, just to hedge my bets here. Thank you so much. Uh, you're muted, Chair Hamlin. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think now I'll, uh, if there's some other comments on this, it seems appropriate that we have Ms. Bowden uh, speak to the committee on the uh, goings on of the Committee of Adjustment Property Standards Committee. Ms. Bowden, are you there? I am here and good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, over 2021, um, the Committee of Adjusted, Adjustment pardon me, has conducted monthly meetings that encourage community and stakeholder participation through a Zoom format. We are a five-member panel of experienced board members drawn from the community um, and greatly enhanced by the expertise of the planning staff. Over the past year, we have conducted uh, timely, consistent, and thorough reviews and decisions on five minor variances, 12 minor variance applications, five consent applications, and one property standard order. And our goals for the following year are to, to continue following the path of fair, timely, and thorough reviews of all applications, and hopefully have um, in-person meetings, which will encourage uh, more community input. One thing to note is that the uh, time of four o'clock, which we followed for the last couple of decades, I would say, is now changing uh, to 3 p.m. start time as of the month of February. So thank you for allowing me to present. And is there any questions? Uh, thank you. Uh for that presentation. Deputy Kirkdall, would there be any members of the public who wish to comment on this report? Thank you, Chair Hamlin. If there's anyone wishing to speak uh, to the Committee of Adjustment, if you could please press the raise your hand feature. And uh, there's no one wishing to speak at this time. All right. And um, I'm gonna take this out. So maybe I'll just do as I did for the last report. I'll just now turn to the committee for any questions they might have or comments. Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you. Uh, and um, just, I really wanted to acknowledge again, uh, the work that this committee does. Uh, you have a, uh, quite a large uh, portfolio and it seems as though uh, COVID has not stopped the number of applications that you have had coming in front of you. So uh, thank you very much for doing such a good job uh, of uh, reviewing all of them. And, uh, um, and thank you for acknowledging the support of the planning department as well. Thank you. 
Uh, any other comments? No? So I'll just finish by saying thank you for coming, Ms. Bowden, uh, and keeping your report so, so short and wonderful. And thank you to your committee for your hard work. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, at this point, I'm going to read in the uh, our action item here, the staff report C2022-05, annual report on development and operations services board and advisory committee activities from 2021 and priorities for 2022 be here and received. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Jeffrey and seconded by Councillor Doherty. Uh, I think we've had pretty good discussion. So I'm gonna call the vote, all those in favor. And that's unanimous. Thank you so much. At this point, uh, we'll go back in the agenda to item number five, which is business arising, arising from previous meeting. Uh, committee, are there any matters from, a previous, from our previous meeting that you'd wish to raise at this time? I see none. So I'm now turning over to CAO Skinner for our weekly update uh, on the interim control bylaw. Thank you, Chair Hamlin. Uh, not too many uh, changes this week, and we do have a, a detailed presentation on one item coming up today. So I'll just uh, run through the highlights. Uh, slide two, please. Um, as uh, the chair mentioned, uh, we have a resolution from council that asks that each week until the ICBL is lifted, uh, we would provide updates to council and to the public on a number of items, including negotiations, building permit applications, water supply, et cetera. And uh, those are updated in this deck. Next slide. Uh, so the situation hasn't changed. We have a water supply. If you're having a glass of water, it's safe and available. And uh, however, we did uh, become aware and made council aware uh, early last year um, or uh, in the second or third month of last year um, of the difficult situation. And uh, council has been very proactive and uh, very transparent in seeking further capacity and managing the remainder. So we have an interim control bylaw that's temporarily and transparently pausing development for everyone. However, we have been able to um, uh, propose exemptions to council for ready to go development applications. Uh, so the ones that were proposed have gone forward. Uh, however, we are um, from a staff perspective, looking at those developments uh, from a different lens, really looking at what will build a complete community for Collingwood uh, for everyone's benefit and uh, making sure that those applications do fulfill the, uh, the goal of a complete community. Uh, so with uh, chlorine maximized and some new ultraviolet, ex uh, ultraviolet treatment expected in the existing plant in 2023, we're getting closer to uh, uh, bridging the gap to the end of 2025 or early 2026 when we get more water, but we're not quite there and thus we need uh, to uh, manage very carefully and we're proceeding as I'll note in a moment on uh, uh, some policies uh, for our community. Uh, next slide please. Uh, so the first half of the deck is a water capacity update. Next slide. Uh, no big changes on this slide uh, with respect to the expansion, still moving well. Uh, the uh, Simcoe County's consultant, R.V. Anderson, did present their final report to the Committee of Counts County Council uh, recently. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing the region-wide a water deck that looks at water and wastewater. There's some very interesting material provided there about multi, multi municipality collaboration. Uh, it is um, potentially a little further out than our current challenges, uh, but in the longer term, the, uh, the 10 year plus view, uh, there's some good thinking there uh, around how to best service our broader area. Next slide. Uh, no changes in the milestones and progress. We are on track uh, right now to hit the uh, items that uh, um, the manager presented to, uh, to uh, committee and council recently. Next slide. Uh, also no changes in the remaining water supply. Uh, we did have, as you may recall, uh, several exemptions, uh, small exemption requests uh, go to uh, Strategic Initiatives Committee recently, and they will be coming back to Council. And if so, there will be a minor adjustment of several single dwelling units worth of, of water and some changes of use that uh, may be approved. 
And if so, we will update this slide and show you the changes. Next slide, please. Um, I had mentioned the exemptions and there's been no changes, so I'll just go to the next slide, please. Uh, the second half of the update is about the land use planning policy study. Next slide. Um, so we are on track with this schedule that you've, people with good eyes have been able to read for a while. Uh, we've just simply moved the, uh, the arrow over so that we're in the week of Valentine's Day, uh, February 14th. Uh, and anticipate uh, next week meeting with staff to review some comments on the uh, proposed, uh, the consultant and staff to review comments on the proposed water allocation policy uh, that we had uh, several public meetings on uh, last week on the 9th. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, nothing has changed on this slide. Uh, we have the, uh, we had the, um, a presentation today of a staff report uh, to you, to this committee around the uh, zoning amendment related to our, uh, our water allocation. So that will be coming up on your agenda today. Uh, hopefully we will uh, get uh, uh, through this in a timely manner. And uh, if in fact, uh, council is able to uh, ratify the decision in late February, and there's a notice of decision, late March would be the last day of appeals and uh, hopefully we would be able to lift the interim control bylaw uh, in April. Otherwise, if there are appeals, the interim control bylaw would be extended and may delay some of our ability to move into the new world of uh, water allocation using our, uh, our transparent policy. But we are hoping to be able to move forward on schedule. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, just the permit status. It hasn't changed uh, from, uh, a I don't believe it's changed from last week. Certainly the single development units of water on the right side haven't changed. Of the 479 single devel development units worth of water uh, that have received exemptions, uh, building permits have been issued for 295 of those units. So they're in flight to being used. Uh, there's about 90 that haven't received an application, uh, 62 under review, and we have 33 in reserve for affordable housing. Uh, as was directed by council when the interim control bylaw uh, was originally passed last April. Uh, so this is a second last slide and the this slide in the pie chart shows the percentage of capacity by building permit status. Um, so 61% of the capacity um, has had its building permits issued. Uh, that's the, the big the big slice on the right with the blue. Next slide please. And you can slice this information differently um, if you look at the same numbers, but you look at as the percentage of total building permits available under exemptions and whether or not they've been applied for, uh, you'll see that uh, there's a large slice, 40% uh, for which we have no application. Uh, many of these are smaller projects um, uh, because they don't represent a large proportion of the water, but there's a number of folks out there who are eligible to apply for building permits and we'd encourage them to, to do so if they're, uh, they're ready to go in their projects uh, uh, and to fulfill their exemption uh, eligibility. And that's it for today's update. Uh, thank you very much and I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you, CEO Skinner for your update, much appreciated. So we have four staff reports on the agenda tonight. Uh, the first one, uh, oh, Mayor Saunderson, would you like to address the committee? Yes, please, Madam Chair. I just had a question about the uh, presentation from CAO Skinner. Um, yes, go ahead. And um, um, I, if you could put the presentation back up, I think it's slide three, it's just the timelines and where we are. And I had a question about one of the items on the timeline. Yeah, that's it. Oh, sorry, right there. And so um, just looking on the right hand side, uh, when it talks about fall 2021 discussion with the uh, new Tecumseh Town of Blue Mountains and MECP with respect to the reduced supply, I'm just wondering what the role of the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks is um, and, if, and whether we've had to involve them at this point. Theo Skinner? I, uh, 
I think that is related to, uh, through you, Chair, uh, to the uh, ratings on the plants. And uh, if you, uh, if it's okay, I'll direct that to Director Slama. Director Slama, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair Hamlin. Yeah, through you to uh, Mayor Saunderson. So at the at the beginning of this process, we um, we did want to have some conversations with the ministry who do regulate uh, or who, who do kind of like monitor and regulate right our, our licenses and our permits and um, specifically our partners. Uh, that we supply water to asked uh, for some a joint conversation because we wanted to look at where the supply that we provide them, how that plays into their uh, license and if they're dependent on that supply, like or to what extent they're dependent on our supply, um, which would speak to our ability to supply them less. So if if their license said, you know, they are dependent on the supply we provide, then we, it would, we would be in a hard position to uh, look to reduce our supply to them. Uh, that wasn't the case uh, for either uh, New Tecumseh or Town of the Blue Mountains. And uh, we also initiated that initial conversation just to uh, be transparent with the ministry and make sure that they were aware of our situation. And I believe also committee said, you know, are, is there a means for them to assist us? I can uh, see a Skinner. Did you want to add to that? Yes, please, Chair. Uh, thank you, Director Slama. Uh, I would also add that MECP has been very cooperative. They've uh, enabled the folks from two or three divisions to support Collingwood in the broader area in this work. Uh, they worked very hard with our staff to uh, help us with our permit to take water that will allow uh, a larger flow through the uh, uh, the current plant than we've been able to achieve in the in the past uh, as the expansions uh, continue. Um, so it it, uh, it it was very productive to have those conversations with the ministry and highlight uh, that we needed quick turn turnarounds from them. And I'm very mm -hmm. pleased with it. Thank you. Thank you. Any any follow up, Mayor Saunderson? Well, thank you very much to Director Slama and CEO Skinner for that information. It was uh, it's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, so would any other committee member have a question uh, relating to our interim control bylaw updates? Okay, so uh, on to item 7.1, the first staff report. Uh, it's P2022-05, proposed zoning bylaw amendment, servicing capacity allocation framework for the town of Collingwood. Uh, Director Valentine, are you going to give us the overview of the report? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and happy Valentine's Day to the committee members, uh, staff, and guests that are, are joining us today, and I couldn't resist putting a little heart next to the date there. Maybe it's because of my last name. I'm not sure, um, but we do have a brief presentation to accompany the staff report um, regarding the proposed zoning bylaw amendment recommended through the Land Use Planning Policy Study as one of three products that would ultimately form the servicing capacity allocation framework for the Town of Collingwood. Next slide, please. As general background, and as noted in CAO Skinner's presentation, in response to municipal water treatment capacity limitations, the town passed an interim control bylaw in April of last year to pause development and then move quickly to retain a consultant to review the land use planning documents and ultimately to recommend a capacity allocation framework for the town. The lead consultant for that study is Meridian Planning Consultants, and unfortunately, due to a conflict, Mr. McDonald is not able to be here with us tonight, so I will be providing the presentation on behalf of the study team, and we also have former interim director Glenn here with us today, and he does remain an advisor on this project and certainly can assist in any questions that committee may have. Next slide, please. So uh, this slide is quite detailed. We certainly won't go through it all. Suffice it to say, we've come a long way in the land use planning policy study thus far from the background research and preliminary consultation that was done in the summer and fall of 2021 through to early this year where the second draft of the overall framework was released. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, the proposed servicing capacity allocation framework does include three prongs. In the gray at the bottom of the screen is a representative of the recommended draft official plan policies, which are to be combined and incorporated into the ongoing comprehensive review of the town's official plan. 
Also at the bottom of the screen in uh, the brownish gray is the servicing capacity allocation policy, which as noted by CAO Skinner is undergoing a second round of consultation, but will ultimately require council approval. And that takes us up to the top or the apex of this particular uh, schematic, which is the zoning bylaw amendment. And that is part of our discussion today. Next slide, please. So why is the zoning bylaw amendment being proposed? The town uh, does require a tool to prevent the issuance of building permits for development unless municipal servicing capacity and infrastructure are available for those developments. This is uh, most important for proposals that do not require Planning Act applications in order to proceed to the building permit stage. And some examples are building of an individual house on a small vacant lot, and you'll see some of those small vacant lots highlighted on the screen, or changing from one permitted use on a property to another. And uh, these smaller proposals do actually represent a significant amount of development potential in the town and hence have significant servicing capacity needs. Next slide, please. So to address the issue, the effect of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment would be to provide an opportunity for the town to confirm whether adequate municipal services are available through the zoning compliance process when considering an application for a building permit. And this gives us an ability to control and track the allocation of municipal servicing capacity at the building permit stage if it is not already addressed through previous planning approvals and or other agreements. What does this mean? It means that building permits would only be available for the use of land or construction of structures if adequate municipal service water and wastewater services are available. Uh, there would be some exceptions to uh, the zoning bylaw amendment and that would be to permit development on private services and that means a septic and well, typically in the rural area, or for minor construction activities. Next slide, please. The amendment itself is relatively straightforward and would add three new provisions to the town zoning bylaw. The primary pr provision, which is the first one on the slide, would be to allow the town to confirm the availability of capacity prior to issuing building permits. And the second two provisions on the slide deal with the exceptions. One is for the small scale construction activities, and those are essentially the same that you see in the ICBL today. So for decks, patios, renovations, rebuilding, et cetera. And the second clause is for those areas and zones in the municipality where uh, municipal water and wastewater services are not yet available and rural type development would proceed on private well and septic systems. Next slide, please. So the zoning bylaw amendment was circulated as required by the Planning Act and uh, no comments or objections were received from uh, other town departments or agencies. A public meeting was held on January 24th and five letters were received and those letters have been linked in your staff reports should you wish to uh, look at their submissions in the entirety. Um, also should mention that an additional letter was received after the agenda was posted from Plan Wells and Associates on behalf of two local developers and that letter was provided to council earlier today. The staff report does summarize the comments received and the response, noting that several of the comments were related to the other products that form part of the overall framework. So focusing on the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, feedback was specific to the timing of approval, subjectivity of the language used, relationship to existing development rights and legal questions. So we thank those members of the public and the development community that provided the comments. Uh, the study team reviewed them in detail. There was discussions with our uh, chief building official. We looked at how other municipalities were using similar wording in their zoning bylaws. And we also received uh, legal advice on some of the concerns raised. No changes resulted to the proposed bylaw ultimately from the uh, submissions that were received. Next slide, please. The staff report does contain the detailed planning analysis, which is also summarized on this slide. The Planning Act permits municipalities to include these types of provisions in their zoning bylaws. And it is the opinion of planning services staff, as well as the wider study team, that the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is consistent with the provincial policy statement and conforms to the applicable provincial plans, the county and town official plan, and does enhance the existing zoning bylaw provisions. 
Next slide, please. So what are we trying to achieve here with this amendment? The primary desired outcome of the proposed amendment would be to work in conjunction with the other tools to achieve objectives such as fair and transparent service and capacity allocation, planning for a complete community, and allowing for the responsible management and tracking of a limited resource. The proposed zoning bylaw amendment provides the backstop, ensuring that building permits can only be issued if adequate municipal servicing infrastructure and capacity is available. So what the amendment is not intended to do is to provide for additional exemptions to the interim control bylaw that's being done through a separate process. And I should note that today is the deadline uh, for anyone wishing to submit additional exemption requests for industrial, commercial um, and institutional conversions or for accessory residential dwelling units. The amendment is uh, not intended to require a policy update to the official plan in advance of enacting the bylaw. In this opinion of the study team, this is not necessary, but is a parallel process that is ongoing at the same time. And lastly, the bylaw is not intended to duplicate the details found in the servicing capacity allocation policy, which is another prong of our approach. Next slide, please. Three other outcomes that uh, we would like to highlight. Determining whether capacity is available may include a capacity reserve bank, which is specifically established for certain types of development. And that could be for smaller scale proposals or for government driven projects with strong community benefits, such as an affordable housing project, for example. The zoning bylaw amendments intended to implement the land use planning policy study, where we will look at all development th through a capacity lens. And then lastly, once the zoning bylaw amendment is passed and in effect, um, if presuming that that does come to pass and council sees that as a, an appropriate course forward, the interim control bylaw could be repealed. Next slide, please. We're closing in on the end of the presentation. Um, in terms of next steps, as we highlighted earlier, we're quite a long ways down in the process. Uh, pending committee's passing of the resolution this evening, Council would ultimately decide whether to approve or refuse the zoning bylaw amendment. And after issuing notice of Council's decision, there is a 20 day appeal period. If there are no, if there are no appeals received, the zoning bylaw amendment comes into effect and the interim control bylaw can be lifted in April. If there is an appeal received, the ICBL is automatically extended under the Planning Act until the appeal can be resolved. And at that time, council may wish to consider additional exemptions to the bylaw to allow shovel ready projects to continue. Next slide, and I think it's the last slide as well. Yes, it is. In terms of communication for those watching the proceedings today and who are interested in receiving a notice of council's decision on this matter, please contact Clerk Almas in writing and her email address is available on the screen. If you have general questions about the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, about the overall land use planning policy study, the ICBL, or the exemption process, your first point of contact would be community planner Wukash, and his information is on the slide, or you can certainly reach out to myself. I believe that does conclude our presentation, Madam Chair, and happy to respond to any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Clerk Dahl, would there be any member of the public who has any comments or questions? Thank you, Chair Hamlin. I'll call to the public if there's anyone wishing to speak to this item, if you could please press the raise your hand feature. And just a reminder that uh, you're provided with five minutes to address the committee. And there's no one wishing to speak to this item at this time. All right, I'll take the opportunity now to read in the recommendation. Uh, that staff report P2022-05, proposed zoning bylaw amendment, servicing capacity allocation framework for the town of Collingwood be received. And further, that council enact and pass an amending bylaw attached as Appendix A to prohibit the use of land or the erection or use of buildings or structures unless adequate municipal water and wastewater services are available to service the land building or structures except where development is permitted on private, individual, on-site water and wastewater systems and or for minor construction activities. Could I have a mover and a seconder, Mayor Saunderson? And Councillor Jeffrey, thank you. Would the Standing Committee have any questions or comments? Mayor Saunderson. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you to Director Valentine. Um, Summer, uh, when you were in your presentation, you talked about the parallel processes, and I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. Um, the allocation framework is the is the process that we will uh, at our planning department use to assess um, building applications or uh, development applications, and that the uh, zoning bylaw. When you talk about that being the parallel process, the amendment to the zoning bylaw um, actually enables uh, a town to, or our CBO, our building department, not to issue a building permit where there is concerns that the town will not have adequate water supply to, to meet that uh, permit. So um, I just wanna be sure that I understand that the, the zoning bylaw amendment really is the underpinning that gives um, uh, substance to our allocation framework because the town will be in a position to not issue a building permit if there is concerns that there won't be adequate capacity to service that permit. Is that how that's working? Go ahead, uh, Director Valentine. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair, uh, to uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that, I think that's a good summary. I would suggest that all three tools of the uh, capacity, servicing capacity framework will work together, but certainly the zoning bylaw is what we've called the backstop. Um, so uh, Mr. McDonald has said to this committee on numerous occasions it would uh, it would prevent a, another ICBL for having to be passed for the same reason and would allow the CBO um, on the advice of uh, planning services and uh, environmental services staff through the zoning compliance process to uh, determine whether there is adequate capacity available and that a building permit should be issued. So all three tools do work together. Um, there is a parallel process that we are updating the policies at the same time. Um, but as, as this tool is the backstop, as you mentioned, um, it is one of the priority items to move forward. And uh, especially since there is an appeal process that is associated with it, um, staff do feel like uh, we should uh, be pushing forward with this and determining what our appeal landscape looks like before the ICBL is set to expire in April. Thank you, and, and that does address my question. So basically we would not be in a position to lift our ICBL until and unless we have this zoning bylaw amendment in place. So we're just looking at the chair. So through you, yeah, Madam Chair, um, uh, not only is that uh, correct, but the Planning Act automatically extends the ICBL. So it takes that decision right away from the municipality. If there is an appeal to the bylaw under the Planning Act, the ICBL will continue to be in effect until that appeal is resolved. Thank you, uh, Director Valentine. And uh, those are my questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the committee members? Uh, I have one, and I sorry I didn't think of it till you're making your presentation. So if you don't have an answer, please just treat it as a comment. <laughs> um, uh, I know one of the exemptions is for an accessory building, uh, and of course I'm thinking it might be a garage with some storage space, for example. Um, if and so it would get a building permit, and there'd be no capacity allocation questions. If the owner of that pro uh, property later decided to make that accessory structure um, a residential unit, uh, would, would there still be a building permit required that would require uh, then an allocation be uh, committed before they could proceed to a conversion? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So depending on the situation, there may or may not need to be a building permit issued, but there certainly would need to be a change of use um, uh, exercise that would be undertaken. And, and this sort of speaks to how the three tools would work together, um, because at this time, if staff were to refer to the proposed servicing capacity allocation policy, accessory residential dwelling units of the type that you're talking about would also be exempt under the policy. Mm. Um, and, uh, and that was done because it is a, is a very high benefit and low risk, um, but it is part of the proposed policy. So if it turned out that secondary dwelling units were using 
large amounts, much larger amounts of capacity than staff uh, were anticipating, there's a, an opportunity for council to revisit that type of exception. So it's it's sort of an it depends answer. Um, and you are illustrating quite eloquently how the three tools will um, work together um, to achieve the town's goals for capacity allocation. Okay, thank you. All right, so at this point, uh, let's see, I'm going to uh, ask for a vote. All those in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you so much. The uh, second staff report on the agenda has, is PW 2022-01, uh, Annual Water Compliance Report. Who will be giving the report on, on this tonight? Oh, Director Slama, please go ahead. Oh, thank you, Chair Hamlin. I'll just, I just wanted to uh, provide some introductory remarks. Uh, we do have our compliance officer, Marie Richardson, with us here this evening. And so Marie will walk us uh, through the report um, as she is our in-house uh, expert on uh, water regulations and in making sure that, we, uh, that we're always achieving those. Uh, we also have Manager McGinnity. She's also here this evening. And so following Marie's presentation, uh, you know, any, any of the three of us would be available to provide or to answer any questions. So before Marie starts, I just wanted to say a few words about this annual report and how the information um, that uh, Marie will be going through this evening is a little bit different than the operational information that is presented to uh, committee and council weekly through our ICBL uh, water capacity update. Uh, the annual report is a requirement of the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, the information is very focused and it's very specific to uh, water qu quantity and quality uh, data that is related to our ministry license and drinking water works uh, permit. So um, you will see some values contained in the report uh, that appear to show, might appear to show a different situation from what we show in our weekly update. And so I just wanted to stress that, of course, the, the information that is contained in this annual report is accurate but, but part, and speak to some of the differences. So the difference um, in the information that you see today in the compliance report as it compares to our water capacity situation, uh, that weekly, the weekly update we provide speaks to some of our operational limitations at our water treatment plant as it stands today. And it's also speaking to how we're managing our remaining capacity until the plant expansion is built. So uh, just as a reminder, our water situation is that in cold water conditions, uh, we are not able, we can only achieve our rated capacity of 31.1 megaliters a day if we increase our chlorine dosing to very high levels. And uh, because we, we felt and, uh, uh, Council uh, also uh, was provided that information and gave direction to staff that we wanted to limit what that chlorine dosing is. We don't have that full rated capacity, uh, but it is important that uh, for the annual report that those numbers are reflected in the report as the ministry requires. So uh, based on the proactive direction that council provided our staff to advance the water treatment plant expansion uh, and also moving ahead with the installation, uh, installation of UV disinfection um, in 2022 in the interim, um, this is all part of the good work that council and staff are doing to um, address those operational limitations and um, have our situation so that our water treatment plant can achieve the 31.1 megaliters a day. So um, I just wanted to mention that uh, because uh, we recognize that, you know, when you see some of the numbers, it, it just might seem shockingly different. Uh, so address it. And uh, as I said, following Marie's presentation, um, the three, uh, Heather and I are here. If, if there's any questions specifically about maybe how some of the numbers relate to the uh, weekly update, we're here to answer those. So with that, I'll pass it over to Marie. Okay, thank you for that overview. And Maria, take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Next slide, please. So 
sorry. So the annual water compliance report is comprised of two reports required under the Safe Drinking Water Act, plus a summary of the annual manage management review required under the Drinking Water Quality Management Standard, the DWQMS. The report covers the 2021 calendar year and the regulation requires the report to be posted on the town website no later than February 28th. So the following slides are some highlights from the report. Next slide, thank you. Uh, there were no incidents of adverse drinking water tests this year. In 2020, we had two adverse events of low chlorine residual in the distribution system. We created an action item that resulted in the purchase of two seasonal auto flushers that should prevent future reoccurrence. Next, please. New to the report is the CT requirements for the 0.5 log inactivation of GRD assists. So the red line is the, our minimum requirement. The blue line is the minimum log inactivation that we achieved. And the green line, just for reference, is the chlorine level at the time that it was achieved. So chlorine is one of the five factors that go into CT calculation. The others are pH, temperature, volume, and flow rate. Chlorine is the only variable that we can control, and so we adjust the chlorine dosing to meet the requirements set by the other variables. Next, please. So chlorine is controlled through a set residual target rate and programming algorithms that continually adjust the amount of chlorine injected to meet the target. In 2021, the target dose was 1.75 milligrams per liter in the summer months, and we went up to 1.9 milligrams per liter in winter. Council endorsed up to 2.2 milligrams per liter if needed for cold water and high flows. The final chlorine residual will vary above and below the target rate as shown in the graph. The variance can be attributed to both the amount of chlorine that is consumed in the disinfection process, lowering the residual, and the response time of the system in adjusting to sudden changes. Next, please. As reported last year, the two adverse events from 2020 were captured in the 2021 Ministry Inspection Report. And with those events, we received a 95.91% risk rating. We met all the other requirements in the remainder of the inspection. And just for reference, the way the ministry inspection works, the two events count as a single event of non-compliance. That's why it just shows one, although we had two adverses last year, or in 2020, sorry. Next slide. All of our chemical and bacteriological sampling results showed everything was well within the required limits, with most results showing none detected. Next, please. We are seeing a slightly rising trend of trihalomethanes. These are disinfection byproducts formed when the chlorine reacts with naturally occurring organics in the water. We're far from reaching the maximum limit. We are not quite halfway, but they are worth noting because of the slight upward trend. Um, it will be interesting though to compare these levels after the UV system is installed and we're able to lower the chlorine levels leaving the plant. Next, please. The capacity of our system is set in the municipal drinking water license based on the ability of the treatment plant to meet all disinfection requirements. Our maximum day, which is the day with the highest usage of the year, was at 81% of our capacity. Overall, our water use was up 1% from 2020. We're still seeing some effect from the pandemic restrictions. We had an unusually cool and rainy July, which also had an effect on usage. The maximum day is usually in July, but this year is in June at the end of a hot dry spell. Next, please. So residue management in our license refers to the raw water that we return to the bay from the filter process. So the water is continuously pumped out of the filter basins to remove the particles that are too large to pass through the filters. Our license is always required that we test this water for suspended solids and maintain an annual average below 25 milligrams per liter. And we've always been complying in that requirement. But new this year when we renewed our licenses, is the requirement to test for total chlorine residual and keep the annual average below 0.02 milligrams per liter. Our annual average was in exceedance at 0.04. So chlorine is introduced into the filter basins through the back pulse system, and the plant won't have the capacity to remove that chlorine until after the expansion project is complete. Previous to this new requirement, we injected chlorine at the raw water intake to control zebra mussels that would have led to a much higher level of chlorine in the raw water. So to keep those chlorine levels to a minimum, we instead hired a contractor to physically remove the mussels. So the exceedance and actions taken were reported in writing to the ministry um, local office as stipulated in the license, and they've accepted the report with no further actions required. Next slide, please. 
So the next section includes highlights from the annual management review as required in the DWQMS. So the purpose of the management review is to evaluate the QMS following 16 prescribed topics, identify any deficiencies, and create action items to address any deficiencies or other needs. The results of the re review must be communicated to the owner. And so the following slides are some highlights from that section of the report. The internal audit of our system was completed by an experienced consultant. We had no non-conformances and four opportunities for improvement. The opportunities for improvement are suggestions only, but in this case, all four items have been implemented. This year, we had a new external auditor supplied by our accreditation body, NSF. There were no non-conformances and three opportunities for improvement identified in the audit. All three items were reviewed and implemented. In spite of the best laid plans, emergencies can happen. Our emergency plan identifies possible emergency situations such as equipment failure and extreme weather events and lays out a plan for recovery and mitigation. A section of the plan is tested each year. This year, we had two real life events to test our plan. One was the frazzle ice blockage that occurred last February, and the other was the failure of one of the high lift pumps at the water treatment plant. Following each event, we held a debrief session with the operation staff to look at what went right, what went wrong, and what we could do better next time. In both cases, nothing went terribly wrong except for the event itself, but we were able to make some improvements to our procedures, mostly around the lines of communication. The number of main breaks tracked over time provides an indicator of the overall integrity of the distribution system. The low number of main breaks in 2020 may have been due in part to that unusually mild winter we had. Last year, we had 14 main breaks, which is above our five-year average and represents a slightly rising trend over the past five years. So the new asset management plan update includes some investments in water main renewals and hiring a new capital project manager to support the completion of identified renewal projects. The, back, sorry, the backflow prevention program entered its fifth year in 2021. The total number of ICI premises compliant with the program is now 620 out of a total of 626. In other words, um, a 99% compliant. So there are many changes ahead for the water department that can affect the QMS and operations. The pandemic can affect staffing and also procurement as it continues to affect the global supply chain and pricing. There are two new positions starting in 2022 and more than one capital project occurring at the same time. So these changes cause some level of disruption and consume staff time and resources. So finally, we know that the water department is undergoing some major and positive changes in the coming years. And we know that with change comes increased risk. But by being aware of the risks and working together to manage the changes, we will continue to provide a safe, reliable source of potable water to our consumers and continue to meet or exceed all legislative requirements. And that concludes our presentation. And we'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marie, for that very comprehensive and very positive report. Good work. Um, Deputy Clerk Dahl, would there be any members of the public who wish to make a comment or ask a question? And if there's anyone wishing to speak to this report, if you could please press the raise your hand feature at the bottom of the screen. And there's no one wishing to speak to this report tonight. Thank you. I'll read in the recommendation that staff report PW 2022-01. 2021 annual water compliance report be received and that the report be considered that at the February 22nd, 2022 council meeting to ensure the legislated deadline specified in Ontario regulation 170 slash 03 drinking water systems will be met and the council directs staff to post the 2021 annual water compliance report on the town's website no later and February 28, 2022. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Doherty and Nurse Anderson, thank you. Would the any member of the committee have questions or comments on the report? Nurse Anderson, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, through you to um, to staff, uh, whoever wants to take these questions, and thank you for that presentation. 
My first question is, uh, in the report, you indicate that there is a strong or remains a strong correlation between total treated water volume and the amount of summer pre precipitation received. And I'm wondering if you can explain that and if it has to do with watering lawns or what's the correlation? That question. I can take that if you'd like. Okay, <laughs> Mr. McGinney, go ahead. Uh, yes, to you, Madam Chair, to Mr. Mayor. Um, you are correct. It is a correlation between irrigation requirements. Typically, we see a significant increase in lawn watering happening during these dry spells. And as Marie mentioned, typically we've seen them in July, peaking in July. Um, this year, our July was fairly wet and cool, so we didn't have that same um, spike in water usage, but we did have a hot, dry June. So that ended up being where our maximum day demand occurred in 2021. Thank you for that. And uh, I guess just really a comment there. I know we, we this summer had a town uh, plan for rain barrels. And uh, I know uh, that uh, Greenland Engineering was involved in a um, smart rain barrel that would uh, trap water and then uh, through a, water, a weather app would release it to, before a storm event so it would be ready to receive more uh, storm water. And it just with everything that's going on in our community and the need for uh, purified water, it seems uh, um, um, unnecessary uh, to be using it to water our lawns. Uh, so I, I'm hopeful that we can continue with that public relations campaign to raise awareness about the importance of, of uh, harvesting rainwater. The second question uh, I have um, through you, Madam Chair, to staff, the frazzle ice, uh, those seem to be increasing. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's a correlation with frazzle ice and not having ice on the water, on the surface. Does that mean that the water temperature gets colder down lower or how do we get more frazzle ice when there's actually no ice cover on the bay? Manager McGinnity, is that you again? I can try. Um, <laughs> I'm not a frazzle ice expert, <laughs> but I can, um, yes, it does have to do with the thermal variations within the water and the very specific conditions in which the ice, um, will start to form, I guess, clusters within and suspended in the water as it, and then as it gets drawn into the intake, it gets built up around the intake of ice formation that ends up blocking the intake. So what we end up having to do is backwash to so push water out of the intake in order to clear, clear the intake of the ice that has formed and allow us to be able to, to start um, treating water again, pulling water back in from the lake. So I can't say specifically, you know, if it's because there's no um, ice barrier, I'm sure that contributes uh, surface surface ice formation, but it is very specific temperature conditions and climate conditions that we observe this, this happening. Okay, and and uh, that leads into my final area of inquiry and that's um, the chlorine treatment and uh, Marie in her presentation referred to the fact that the colder the water is the more chlorine we need to dose uh, it. And uh, so I'm just wondering if based on the frazzle ice formation increasing in frequency, uh, is the water temperature cooler than on the intake requiring more, uh, more chlorine or uh, slowing down, I guess, the chlorine processing, uh, which then impacts the output of our plant in the winter. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so I would not necessarily um, see a specific correlation between frazzle ice formation and what we've seen in um, kind of winter water temperatures. We, you know, winter does extend over a period of several months and we do get some slight temperature variation within the lake. And it's very, like I said, it is very specific uh, climate conditions that are required for frazzle ice to occur. Um, in terms of lake temperature, I would say that, you know, again, it does relate to the, the seasonal fluctuations, the temperatures that we're seeing. Um, and, you know, in previous years, maybe it hasn't been as cold um, as this year. We, we are noticing it being a little bit colder this year than it was in uh, last year in particular. But no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that there is a direct correlation between the frazzle ice and the chlorination requirements. Okay, and then just a follow up on that. So my understanding then is that the, the reason we need to uh, use the chlorine so heavily is that it kills uh, three of the, 
I, I forget the terminology for them, but the bacteria or, or the logs or whatever, how you refer to it. And so that the UV, UV disinfection can do that for at least two of those bacteria and that the remaining bacteria takes less chlorine to kill so that our chlorine consumption will go down as we uh, put the UV disinfection in place. And so ultimately, uh, when, these, uh, when we retrofit the current plant, we will have the same output year round. Who would like to answer that question? I can try. Okay, <laughs> or Marie, did you want to? I'll let Marie answer a question. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Marie. <laughs> so it's the, um, the requirement that's taking all the chlorine is the 0.5 log Giardia um, in activation of viruses. Most of the, you actually have to get four log, but a lot of it's coming through the filter system, but they insist that 0.5 has to be done through disinfection. And because they're cysts, chlorine has to work a lot harder to get through them. They're like little legs, they're harder to, to get through to inactivate them, whereas UV is very, very effective. So with a UV dose, you can clear it out very quickly. So it's getting rid of that requirement that is allowing us, um, the chlorine will just have to do four log removal of virus, which it can do at a much lower CT level. Okay, so the, yeah. the good news being that we will, oh, go ahead, sorry, I didn't go ahead, go ahead, Manager McGinnity. Yep, just one further point of uh, follow-up. So um, what Marie is speaking to is what we call primary disinfection. We are required to also provide secondary disinfection to maintain a chlorine residual in our distribution system. So that's, uh, we will still have to provide, you know, some level of disinfection to be maintained throughout the, the dis distribution system. So just noting that, you know, in order to achieve that, um, we will still see, you know, chlorine similar to what we have been disinfecting at uh, in the, historically. And so the very good news is that we will have our, our, when the disinfection, UV disinfection comes online, we'll be using less chlorine, we'll have same water output year round. And just my final question uh, is dealing, and I can't say this word, the THMs and the HAAs, if we use less chlorine, we'll have less of those residuals in our water as well. Is that correct? Marie, is that for you as well? Yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, through the chair. Um, yes, because it's the chlorine that's, it's a disinfection byproduct. So it's the result of chlorine reacting with organic. So if you have less chlorine going in there, you should see less HAAs and less THMs. Very good. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. Thank you. Would any of the other committee members have any questions or comments on this report? Councilor Doherty, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair, <clears throat> and through you to uh, Manager McGinnity and uh, Compliance Officer Marie uh, Richardson. I um, <clears throat> want to thank you very much for a thorough report and particularly for ensuring that our community continues to have a good supply of safe, clean water. Uh, very important, obviously. Um, <clears throat> You uh, were just uh, talking about the installation of the UV disinfection equipment uh, in the plant. And <clears throat> I have been uh, reading uh, most recently about the notion of ozonation as opposed to UV disinfection. And um, because uh, we are becoming more and more aware of compounds that are getting into our drinking water, uh, like uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, like, um, or sorry, into the water that we are pulling in, not into our drinking water, ultimately, but the water that we are accessing. Um, <clears throat> for, uh, fertilizers, microplastics, microfibers, uh, and, and other uh, compounds of concern. Um, Ozonation appears to be extremely effective uh, in eradicating those compounds in addition to the pathogens that we would be using UV for. Uh, and I'm just going to cite um, a study from McGill University um, that indicated in their testing that ozonation um, killed or destroyed all pathogens, 100% of pathogens, plus 86% of uh, chemical contaminants 
in water. And this is compared to only 7% in UV disinfection. So is this uh, a um, facility that we could or should be entertaining for our uh, water treatment facility or even for our wastewater treatment facility because we are using UV in that facility right now? Thank you for your question. Uh, Murray, is this a question for you? Probably not. <laughs> no, Manager McGinnity? Or do you want to take it as a comment? <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, to you, Madam Chair, we could take that as a comment, but I would say specifically to the plant expansion that is underway, it's not something we are pursuing. Um, it would have had to been identified much earlier in the planning process for this facility. We don't currently have um, the ability to incorporate ozone. I'm not sure what would be involved in that process. It's not something I've specifically looked at. So um, in the future, perhaps um, we are trying to keep a, an open mind and, and some space at the site to um, facilitate dis or treatment improvements at the site. Um, if, as you know, drinking water standards evolve and treatment requirements evolve. So that's something we could definitely consider in the future um, if it's the wish of council. Uh, from the wastewater side, again, um, that might be more feasible, and we do have an expansion plan there in the coming years, so that's something that could be looked at as part of the EEA process. And it looks like uh, Director Slama would like to contribute as well. Go ahead, Director Slama. Thank you, Chair Hamlin. I just wanted to add as well that at our water treatment uh, facility, we're using ultra filtration. And uh, so it, it would be good for us to, you know, look at some of this research and see what type of water treatment process is happening before the ozo ozonation versus UV disinfection as forms of disinfection, because our ultra filtration membranes remove quite a, a quite a bit of um, uh, contaminants that are in in the raw raw water. So uh, like I, I just took a quick look and, um, you know, verified that it's removing all of the, what's considered the micro contaminants and it's going into the range of macro contaminants. So it's a very high level of filtration. And in fact, the only level of filtration that's better than our ultra filtration is reverse osmosis. And the one thing that reverse osmosis can filter that our ultra membranes cannot is aqueous salt in water. So I, I, I would, I'd like to, to, yeah, we can take it, you know, take it as a common and, and look into it. Um, but as manager McGinnity states, it's, it might be something for us to consider uh, for the wastewater treatment plan expansion and processes there. Thank you. Any follow-up Councillor Doherty? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, would there be any other questions? Seeing none, uh, I'm going to call the vote. All those in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you very much. The third staff report is found at item 7.3. It's PW 2022-08, Master Stormwater Management Model Report. Uh, over to you, Manager. Or, sorry, Director Slama, are you going to be doing this one? Uh, uh, no, I won't speak to the to the whole uh, uh, presentation and report. Thank you, Chair Hamlin. Uh, we do have uh, representatives from Greenland Engineering here, uh, Jim Hartman, and also we have Manager John Velick here. So uh, Greenland will speak to the report and go through the presentation first, and um, and Manager Velick has a few things to add. So I just wanted to mention that this uh, report is the first phase of a two-phase process to identify stormwater infrastructure improvements for the conveyance and storage of stormwater and riverine flows within our municipality. Um, the technical report is a culmination of invaluable analysis of the town's flood zones. It is a major step forward uh, that Collingwood has completed this analysis in such detail. Um, the stormwater model will pr provide us with important information on how our infrastructure can support varying storm situations, storm events, and will help us uh, help inform the next steps to mitigate our risk. 
So with that, I'll uh, pass it over to Greenland and uh, um, we're all available here for questions at the end. Hey, well, good evening, Mr. Hartman. Thank you for coming to present your report and uh, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I, we're very pleased to, uh, to be able to take uh, a couple of years of culminated work and present it here to, to uh, the committee. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna introduce my other uh, team members here. We have um, Kirsten and Don, are they both on? Uh, able to get on to, to do the presentation. Just, I can't see them, so I just want to make sure. Yes, present. Thanks. We're here. <clears throat> okay, Kirsten. So we want to keep this uh, relatively short. And and as Peggy said, there'll be an opportunity for some questions at the end. So if there's anything that you think we've sort of moved quickly over, be, be sure to ask questions at the end. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jim. Um, so as mentioned, we're here to go over the town of Collingwood's townwide existing conditions, swim assessment and model. So next slide. All right, so just as a bit of an introduction to the project. Uh, so Greenland was retained to complete an existing conditions stormwater management or swim model, uh, which consists of both the existing storm sewer drainage system, as well as the multiple rivers and creeks that throw, flow through the town of Collingwood. And this is actually the town's first ever uh, detailed model of the entire storm sewer drainage infrastructure. And correspondingly, the first comprehensive model that considers the interaction of both the storm sewer drainage as well as our riverine systems. Uh, so this uh, existing condition swim model will be able to assist the town with forecast modeling, uh, reviewing the impact of development proposals, asset management, as well as assessing future capital improvement projects. As well, this existing conditions model can now form the basis of a stormwater infrastructure uh, master plan project. Next slide. So Collingwood uh, is a major component of the Blue Mountains watershed. So if you're looking at the figure, it's the most Northwestern uh, watershed in the figure there. Um, and we identified seven significant sub watersheds that outlet within the town of Collingwood. So that includes the Pretty River, Black Ash Creek, Silver Creek, Bateau River, Townline Creek, as well as the urban town center and resort drainage areas. Next slide. So at the offset of this project, uh, data collection was our huge primary focus. So the town staff provided essentially all the information they had. So any uh, plans, studies, reports for any existing or approved developments, um, as well as any existing models that were available. Um, and any and all ads built drawings for road construction and reconstruction projects. Uh, they also provided their asset inventory of stormwater infrastructure, uh, which included things like storm sewers, manholes, catch basins, et cetera. Uh, next slide. Uh, so once we collected all of our existing data, uh, we then had to supplement it with a, some field programs to fill in all of our data gaps. So this included a topographic field survey um, to capture all of our manhole rim and storm sewer invert elevations uh, for areas where the asphalt drawings weren't available. Uh, as well, this included storm sewer flow monitoring, um, which our monitor locations are on the figure there, uh, and meteorological data. So the flow monitoring and meteorological data were used uh, to calibrate our models. And finally, we collected airborne LIDAR data. Uh, so this LIDAR data is used to create a highly accurate uh, digital, elevation, digital elevation model or kind of like a terrain map of the town, uh, which was essential for optimal modeling accuracy. Um, this is actually a value add introduced by Greenland through a concurrent regional project, uh, which helped result in some reduced costs for mobilization and mapping for the town, which is a nice plus. Uh, next slide. So just moving on to our model development and starting with our riverine systems. Um, so using all of our collected data, uh, we updated all of our existing hydrologic models, um, which involved introducing or adding in all the new developments since the initial models had been created, as well as updating all of the watershed boundaries for all our river systems. Um, so these models were then run with our design storms, which started at our two year storm and then kind of went all the way up to our 100 year and Timmins storms, which are the regulatory events for the town of Collingwood. Um, 
So from these hydrologic models, you uh, they produce a magnitude of flow in the river during each of these storm events, which can then be inputted into our hydraulic models. So then these hydraulic models were also created through a combination of existing uh, the existing models available, as well as our LIDAR data. And then we ran them for our 100 year and Timmins storm events to determine the extent of flooding. So our hydrologic model was determined the magnitude of flow, hydraulic model determines kind of our flooding uh, flood line maps there. Uh, next slide. Uh, so then moving on, we then had to, de to develop our models for the urban town center. Um, so to start off, we create a minor system model, which is essentially just our storm sewer network, uh, which is created using our updated storm sewer database. You then add in your overland flow paths. So essentially flow coming in off the road into our patch basins. And then we have our initial base model. Um, so this model was then calibrated uh, using our flow monitoring data. Um, and this calibration process is very important so that we can determine the actual existing conditions within the town rather than kind of our generalized assumptions for what we're assuming um, conditions in the town are. And actually an unanticipated benefit at this point was being able to use uh, data collected from Collingwood's Smart Stormwater Project uh, so real-time internet sump pump data from private home installations around the town was actually used during this calibration process. Um, so once our calibrated model was created, uh, we could then run it uh, for, for our design storm events. So for our two-year storm, all the way up to our 100-year storm and create mapping of the flooded manholes, uh, which is that figure on the top right there. So then at this point, we then wanted uh, to kind of create a comprehensive model that could then look at the culmination of everything we had done so far. Um, so that took our minor system model and added in our riverine systems, as well as that topographic or LIDAR data. Um, and was that was run for our 100 year storm event. And then we could create urb, all of our urban overland flood mapping, which is that figure at the bottom right there. Uh, so next slide. So just at the end of our model development, these are all of our updated watershed boundaries within the town of Collingwood. So you can see there are more than seven colors here because we split out some of our uh, major watersheds into some smaller drainage areas, but this is just kind of our final look at our watersheds in Collingwood. Uh, next slide. I'm just gonna hand this over to Don Moss, who is our in-house water resources expert. Well, thank you. Uh, in conjunction with the uh, town staff, uh, we recognize that there's been considerable questions about uh, our ever-changing climate. So we have had regard for that with all of the analytics that have been done for the modeling. The methodology that we have uh, settled on is one that's been developed through the MTO and they have this IDF curve, which is an intensity, duration, frequency curve. That is the standard method that's been used for decades to size uh, uh, drainage infrastructure. We've looked at it and they have done a, statist a statistical analysis that has uh, projected uh, higher uh, intensities in rainfall for different return period events. And that is what you can see in this particular chart that's here. And uh, the, the blue ones were uh, in essence, uh, the old Environment Canada storm events that we were using and were part of our municipal standards, not only here in Collingwood, but in virtually every municipality throughout the province. And now as MTO has developed this method, it's being adopted by quite a few municipalities and it's reflected in, with the orange uh, bars to show an increase in rainfall that is being used in the analytics. Could I have the next slide, please? So we weren't going to just leave it there. Uh, there has been a considerable amount of investigations into climate change, and we wanted to ensure that the methodology that the town was adopting was going to be able to be stress tested. And so we piggybacked it on some research that Greenland had completed back in 2014, and we followed a methodology from there. 
this methodology included uh, something that's unique to the Collingwood and Blue Mountain areas that uh, we have a considerable amount of snow in the winter time. And of course, we also have the snow making and the ski slopes that are in Blue Mountain, but uh, some of the uh, water courses on the far west side of the, the town of Collingwood are, could potentially be impacted by snow from uh, the town of Blue Mountains. So we had regard for whether or not the snow melt uh, models that we had prepared earlier uh, would uh, create a greater stress. So this method was actually uh, presented at the 2014 Municipal Engineers Association annual conference, and then subsequently to their swim technical group. And then uh, uh, after that, to senior staff at MECP. And uh, so just for the benefit of everybody that is looking at this uh, chart and wondering what it is that we use it for, uh, if you go to the left side of the chart, that is typically the intensities that you would use to size your, your dr sewer drainage and your, your ditch systems within a municipality. The further to the right you go in the chart, you're, you're sizing storage related information. So the yellow line that is shown on here is the impact at a hundred year event with this snow melt impact that we, you would get. And what we did is we, we stress tested it by taking April uh, weather, bringing it back into March when we still have all kinds of snow and saying this could be a worst case scenario if climate starts to move in that direction. And we, uh, we redid all of the statistics with all the weather information and that is the, the intensity we can get. But you notice the black line is the one from frontal storm events that have come through the climate change modeling. And so we've investigated five different climate change models to come up with which one would make the most impact. And this one coincidentally happens to be also similar to what we have with MTO IDF curves. So we're confident that the town has the, the best product that's available at, the, at this moment in time. Uh, go to the next slide, please. So having this regard for all of this, then we ran all of our, our, our rivering floodline mapping. And we, uh, the previous slide we were showing a hundred year storm. Well, in, the regulatory event is even a higher event. So that is the one that's still adopted through the Conservation Authority. And it, we've looked at the greater impact of each of these events. And that's how we've analyzed all the river systems coming through the, the town. We have also identified that there's four spills on the Bato River and uh, there's a small one on Pretty River and two in uh, Black Ash Creek and there's multiple ones in Town Line and Silver Creek. And we'll, if we go to the next slide, we'll give an example. This is the Bateau Creek. Uh, the red line that you see on the outside is the, the uh, extent that the flood waters would go for a regional flood event. And uh, you can see the area is between Highway 26 and uh, the bypass. And uh, that area is not developed for a reason. So because it happens to, to flood as a result of uh, the, the flows that have been previously determined for Bateau. And now you have flood lines to reinforce what's actually happening. Uh, go to the next slide, please. And here we have the, the infamous pretty river going through town and the previous flood mapping that you had for it had a huge spill that went down through the middle of town. And now with the revised flows that have been determined through uh, other consultants and adopted by the, the conservation authority, these flows were imported into our model. And uh, you can see the, the flows stay within the, uh, the berm as you go down through the town. And uh, also that has the methodology we use has regard also for the vegetation being uh, cleared in the, uh, on the, on the banks of the berms. 
Next slide, please. And this, of course, is a similar thing that's happening on the uh, Black Ash Creek. And you see uh, off to the side, there's an area where there's a tributary coming in and there's an area where you have a small spill that if we go to the next slide, we may show it a little bit closer. Nope, next slide goes to uh, the, the final creeks that are over on the, the west end of town. You have Town Line and Silver Creek. And uh, you can see with small blue arrows, there's multiple spills in those areas and they've all been identified and there's flood maps that are included in the reporting that's been prepared for the town. Next slide, please. And we switch back over to Kirsten. Thanks. Um, yep, so then we can start looking at our uh, urban flooded manhole mapping. So again, mapping was completed uh, for the two year return period storm all the way up to the 100 year storm. Um, storm sewers should be able to convey at least the five year storm um, within the town of Collingwood. Uh, depending on their drainage area characteristics, there may be some storm sewers that uh, need to be sized for the 10 or 25 year storm. Um, so our mapping can be used to air identify areas uh, for potential stormwater infrastructure improvements. Um, for example, if there are manholes that are being flooded during our five year storm, uh, further investigation might be warranted uh, by the town in the next phase of the project um, for capital projects that could reduce that flooding. Um, at a high level, this is primarily identified to be an issue in the older areas of Collingwood. Uh, for example, kind of around the tree streets or the Robinson Street area. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our zoomed out map of the uh, town of Collingwood, our urban center. So this is our five year storm event. Um, and if you can see them, if your screens are small, you might not be able to, but there are some small red dots that you'll see along the roadways, um, which are manholes that are being flooded during this storm event. So again, our goal is, or the town's goal should be to have none of these uh, manholes to be flooded during this event. So areas that could be identified in our next phase of the project. Uh, next slide. So then our final mapping assignment was our urban overland flood mapping. Um, so mapping was completed for the 100 year storm event to analyze all of our overland flooding. Um, and this model again has regard for uh, the interaction of our storm sewers, overland flow and the riverine systems. Um, and this will become more important in just one moment, uh, but all the flooded areas are going to be represented in blue. Um, and actually what we did is all of our, uh, our mapping displays all the areas with flooding that's greater than 25 centimeters in dark blue. And this is done because 25 centimeters is the depth criteria, which is used by Simcoe County Emergency Services for the safe movement of ambulances. Um, so this could be a like initial areas of concern for the town to investigate um, with, for uh, areas within the municipal right of way or municipal owned lands where there are flooding depths more than 25 centimeters that could impede the safe movement of ambulances. Uh, next slide. So again, this is our zoomed out view of our urban center. Uh, so this is our 100 year storm event. And again, so all the blue areas are areas where there is flooding on that dark blue is areas where the flooding is more than 25 centimeters in depth. Uh, one thing to note is just, it, it does look like a lot of blue, um, but during the storm event, uh, flooding within the right of way, so along the roads is very much expected because um, if you can remember, storm sewers are generally sized for a five year storm. Uh, so they would be flooded during this event. So really our, our kind of focus is in on those areas that are dark blue. Uh, next slide. So, so just some general conclusions. Uh, so the updated models and mapping represent the existing conditions of the stormwater infrastructure and riverine systems within the town of Collingwood. Uh, consideration has been made for changing climate conditions, although there is the possibility for future stress testing uh, of infrastructure during the next phase of the project. Overall, the existing infrastructure is generally capable of conveying flows per the town's design standards, which is good news for the town. Um, Flood mapping should be used during this next phase of the project to identify potential infrastructure improvement projects. And finally, it's recommended that the town adopt uh, the new riverine flood maps and its update of the official plan. Uh, so next slide. And that's the conclusion of our presentation, if there are any questions. Thank you, Kirsten and, and Don and Jim. I just wanted to jump in um, 
and just have to highlight a couple of points. Um, so the extreme scenarios in some of the images in the presentation and in the reports represent the one in 100 year event. Uh, this event is uh, you know, generally quite unlikely to occur in any given year. However, they do happen um, and staff just want to plan ahead and anticipate these scenarios, which is the purpose of the study or one of the main purposes of the study. Um, the next steps uh, following this are to identify projects that would address deficiencies identified in this phase one project. And this would be done through a municipal class environmental assessment master plan process that would look at um, and assess problems and risks, identify potential solutions and costs and gain feedback from the public and stakeholders. Um, so implementing those recommendations will form part of the future town capital programs and could inform future stormwater user fees should council wish to implement such a tool. Um, the second phase of this study was uh, included in the 2022 budget and staff are prepared to move forward as soon as possible with this work. Um, thank you. And uh, so I guess um, we're just open to any questions you may have. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Um, we'll go first to see if there's any members of the public who have any comments or questions. Thank you, Chair Hamlin. If there's anyone wishing to speak to the staff report, please press the raise your hand feature at the bottom of the screen. And there's no one wishing to speak to this item at this time. Okay, thank you. I'll read in the recommendation that staff report PW 2022-08 Master Stormwater Management Model Report be received for information. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Mayor Saunderson, Councillor Jeffrey, thank you. Would the standing committee have any questions or comments? Mayor Saunderson and then Councillor Doherty. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to our Greenland presenters today, Mr. Hartman, Ms. McFarland, and Mr. Moss. Um, I did have one question. The storm in Timmins from 1961, it talks about over six feet of rain in, half, uh, in 12 hours. Is that the 100-year storm benchmark that you were working off in this flooding uh, modeling process? I can answer that question. It, Go ahead, it was uh, 185 millimeters. Of rain, yes. Oh, 185 millimeters. Okay, I had yeah. centimeters there, so I misread <laughs> that because I was thinking, "Wow, that's that's a lot yeah. of rain." Uh, it rain. is a, it, regardless. It still is a lot of rain. rain. Anytime you get over 100 millimeters, you're getting a lot of a lot of rain. But if you get 100 millimeters in an hour, that's catastrophic. If you get it over two days, it's not so bad. Okay. So, just, just just to make a distinction, though, Your Worship. Um, the hundred year storm and the Timmins storms are two different events that we use. So yes. they're two, two separate uh, events that we, we analyze when we look at flooding conditions. Okay, all right, thank you. And then and I guess, and then you added also the uh, climate change aspect to it by moving that kind of storm into March when we might have snow melt as well. So that would increase the, the, the flow burden. Uh, so what, what uh, ends up happening is that for a lower return period, like your 10-year event or your 25-year event, the snow melt event actually could cause a larger amount of flow in your river systems. However, when, when it comes to stress testing your sewer networks, uh, it, it's not the, the driving force behind it. So... But when we did the original uh, research, we actually went into uh, uh, three or four different universities and also the climate change models that were being developed by Environment Canada and a couple of other agencies at that time. And we, we keep on following that because we've been using this methodology to, to develop our, our flood forecasting methods that we use all throughout, uh, throughout uh, Ontario. So uh, we, we keep up with all of this. And so we're constantly tracking uh, uh, weather events to see what's going to happen, just because we're always interested to see if this time of year, if all of a sudden you get a heat wave and some heavy rain while you still have all the snow on the ground, is that going to be the worst case scenario? So far, it hasn't borne out that way. It still is that, that heavy rainfall frontal system that you get in the middle of the, the summer that comes in quickly and just drops water out of the sky, almost like a fist coming out of the sky to pound you. 
Okay, and so then, uh, thank you for that. My next question really is to our staff, and uh, we're just receiving this report, but uh, Manager Valak, you had indicated that uh, as part of our 2022 budget, we had the, the uh, set aside funds for the EA to continue with the next steps on this, um, this uh, uh, I guess, looking at what our um, shortfalls would be and what our pinch points would be and what issues would be uh, we need to address in the short term, I guess. Um, so is it, it doesn't require any further action of this uh, committee or council to get that second phase going? Uh, through the chair. Yeah. Yes, through the chair, that is correct. Okay, good. Well, we've talked a lot about risk management uh, and it certainly seems is that this, uh, this is an important topic. And uh, so I'm looking forward to us moving forward with, uh, with finding out what the pinch points would be for us in the event of one of these storms. And um, thank you again to our presenters today. Thank you. Uh, would either of the other committee members have any questions or comments? All right, Councillor Doherty, thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you to the Greenland team. Um, the PowerPoint presentation really uh, helped to bring the whole report alive for me because it is really complex stuff. And uh, I am no engineer, I'll tell you. Um, I have a couple of questions and um, uh, Chair, they may actually be more appropriate to staff. Um, so the first question is, based on what we have seen here, are there any areas of town that are of concern today? Uh, in terms of our infrastructure and its, our, its ability to handle uh, today's uh, events and those going forward into the future. So I think this is a, I'll, I'll defer, but my suggestion, perhaps Greenland wants to uh, discuss that because you have all the charts where the flooding is going to occur. Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, I think John may want to, may want to introduce it and then we can, he can direct us as to where he'd like to go with that. I suppose. Okay, good. Sure, Andrew sure. Through, sure, through Chair uh, to Hamlin to uh, Councillor Doherty, we do have our um, we do have a number of areas of town where historically there there is flooding. Um, it's it's uh, a lot of it is in the west end of town. Um, the um, Silver Creek Town Line Creek area uh, does flood. Um, I believe the. Um, uh, Gray Solo Conservation Authority uh, is going to be is beginning a project in 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 combination with the NDCA um, to look at that area more closely. Um, also, the Cranberry Trail West and Highway 26 intersection floods. Um, the town is looking at that intersection this year as a as a capital project to see what can be done there. Um, there, there are a number of areas that traditionally flood. Those kind of two just top off the top of my head. Our storm sewer system generally um, responds quite well. Um, I mean, we haven't had a hundred year storm and then, you know, in the time I've been here, thank goodness. Um, but we, we have had some, you know, closer to the, to the uh, 25 year event storm and, and um, our system performs quite well. Um, we're gonna have to look at the depth of flooding as part of our next phase for emergency access. We see a lot of flooding on the streets, uh, but that's expected and normal. Uh, but what we want to concentrate on is the depth of that flooding, and and I don't I don't have any exact locations uh, off the top of my head right now. Thank you. Any follow up, Councillor Doherty? Uh, yes, uh, please. Um, so my next question is um, based on this mapping. Um, is there uh, any consideration? Would would this have a potential impact? on our current um, development plans and maps. Go ahead, Manager Valak. Yes, through Chair Hamlin to Councillor Doherty. Um, right, off the, right off the bat, um, I think we, I don't, if it's not gonna affect any of our, I, I guess there's two ways of looking at it. One is one is updating our official plan, which will have a direct impact on our on our on on development, and um, more precisely the uh, the Pretty River 
Um, this study has shown and in combination with the maintenance work that we're doing uh, with the NBCA is that um, there is no spill through town. So that will have a, a, a direct impact on development, freeing up some development. Um, but we can use this model as a tool during the development review process. Uh, if we get it just like we use our sanitary models and our, 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 our water, water models, we can use our stormwater model and plug in a development proposal to the model and see what effect it has uh, on, the, on the municipality. So that uh, to me is quite, quite useful. Great, thank you, thank you. And just uh, one more question, Chair, if I may. Um, so we've been speaking uh, quite a bit about hard infrastructure, um, stormwater infrastructure, um, but I'm wondering, are we going to be giving con consideration to other uh, softer um, mechanisms? And I'm thinking, you know, um, green roofs as an example that will become, that absorb uh, water and uh, could be incorporated into uh, residential, well, actually it could be incorporated into any um, development or building plan. Um, the use of permeable pavement as opposed to uh, non-permeable, which is what we see right now, or um, swales, say, in large parking lots as opposed to underground stormwater infrastructure to convey water in that manner. So how much are we going to be considering uh, those opportunities as we plan uh, for the future? So through Chair Hamlin to Councillor Doherty, um, much of those are already considered in, in private development, but I think um, a lot of um, town policy may be affected by what comes out of the environmental assessment in the next phase. Uh, as part of the environmental assessment, we'll be looking at um, alternatives and options dealing with uh, stormwater and, and those, those types of features that you speak of um, would be, I guess, um, compared with other, with other methods. Okay. And when do you anticipate the EA? Um, well, we haven't um, we haven't brought a consultant on board yet, so I don't want to speculate. Um, but I would hope um, end of the year we could have um, maybe our first uh, public information center. Great. Thank you. It's a it's a large project. Yeah, I yeah, no doubt. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right. Well, I have a, I have a few questions, uh, and perhaps just a comment. Um, firstly, I'd also like to thank the team for this fantastic report. Um, in my first year as a counselor, I went to a conference for counselors and, um, there was an insurance company that had a booth there and I went over and had a look and you could put in your town's name, which I did. And a map came up showing a lot of our town subject to flooding during certain storm events. And I came back and a senior staff person I spoke to who's not working with the town any longer dissuaded me <laughs> significantly from thinking about this as being a problem, but it's always been in the back of my mind. So I was so happy to see this report on the agenda for this meeting um, that the mapping has been done and all the detailed thinking that went into this is quite extraordinary, um, including the climate change impacts. Um, I think until we acknowledge there's a problem and see what exactly what it is, we can't possibly move forward to fix it. And um, this is the first step, obviously. There are detailed maps um, attached, uh, as I uh, could see at the very end of your report, uh, the Greenland report in the very last appendix. Uh, and for any of those wanting to know how their particular neighborhood is affected during the 100 year storm, uh, you know, I think it should be known that those that mapping is there. Um, and um, that I really look forward to our staff moving forward on this next step uh, with some plans about how we'll move forward. Um, 
And I wanted to also echo Councillor Doherty's uh, thoughts about what us normal residents can do to help with the problem. And I hope as this eventually unfolds and we move forward with policies for our community, it will include uh, incentives or education around such things as permeable driveways and green roofs and so on. So uh, anyway, those are my comments and thank you. All right, so uh, I would like to bring the matter forward for a vote now. All those in favor? Oh, wait, we have one more, one more request to speak. Go ahead, Councillor Doherty. Sorry, only to say that I saw CAO Skinner's card. Oh, thank you, I did not see it. Go ahead, CAO Skinner, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Chair Hamlin. I did want to make a quick comment. It is very positive, and uh, I didn't want to interrupt the uh, the members' uh, comments, but uh, it is unusual uh, to have a, a report that uh, does what this report does, marrying stormwater with, with river flows. Mm -hmm. uh, not all municipalities have this type of information, and I think it's a big step forward for Collingwood. So my compliments to the town team and to the Greenland team for uh, putting this together for us. It is a big step forward. Uh, so thank you very much to you all. Yes, thank you. And Mayor Saunderson, you have one more thought. I did, and um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Your comments about uh, previous consideration of this item um, prompted a question. And uh, I'm just wondering if uh, staff could comment Back in 2017, we received a report on potential stormwater fee structure. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, staff might talk about how the this report and the EA would then inform that uh, um, stormwater fee um, issue. Who would like to answer that question? Director Salama, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Hamlin. I will ask uh, Manager Velik to speak to it since uh, he uh, co-authored the report. Okay, go ahead, time. Manager Velik. Thank you. Through, uh, through Chair Hamlin. Um, so, a, yes, we wrote a, a user fee um, report in 2017 explaining how, uh, how it could be implemented. Um, and essentially a, a user fee for stormwater is similar to sanitary and, and water user fee. Um, users pay for the service. So water flows off of your property into our storm sewers and, um, and a fee is paid for that service. This project um, can help quantify the projects required to maintain that service. Uh, and to bring it to standard, uh, it, it uh, identifies deficiencies in the system and the next phase will put a cost to that. So um, if we did want to move to a, a fee, uh, user fee system, um, we could use some, we could use the, um, I guess the, um, the costs that come out of the next phase as a, as a baseline. And then um, users can be given, can be incentivized uh, with with discounts for installing things like rain barrows and, and permeable driveways and, and that, that, that sort of infrastructure. So that's how it would tie into that next, uh, that next phase. Does that answer your question? It does, and I'm happy to hear about the incentivizing and I know we'll be talking through our allocation framework and our official plan. There's a lot of, uh, of I think synergies, uh, but it's a great way to uh, enhance that whole process and push the initiative because stormwater is increasingly becoming an issue. So thank you for that. Thank you. And now I've, I think we voted. Deputy Kirkall, do we vote on that yet? No? Okay. All in favor, raise your card and it's unanimous. Thank you. And thank you very much for uh, the team and the presentation. Uh, we've been at this for two hours, 15 almost. So let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, so that means we'll return uh, 725. Yeah, thank you.
Can we proceed now, Deputy Clerk Gall? Thank you. Okay, so the next item on our agenda is 7.4. It's the last staff report for this evening. It's PW 2022-09 Boulevard Parking and Beautification Update. Who would like to make this uh, presentation tonight? Director Slama, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Hamlin. I'll, I'll start. Uh, so we have with us this evening, uh, Manager of Public Works, Daniel Cole, and also Supervisor of Bylaw Services, Adam Herod, is, is also available to answer some questions. And, and both of these gentlemen have, have been instrumental in uh, putting this report uh, together, uh, which is a report of um, options presented to Council in response to a couple of Council resolutions that have come forward in the last couple of years in relation to uh, the boulevards and beautification of the boulevards. So with that, I will uh, hand things over to uh, Manager Cole. Thank you, Director Sloma. Um, pleased to present uh, an update on boulevard parking and beautification, uh, which is to accompany the report that is before the committee this evening. Next slide. Uh, as background, in 2018 and 2020, Council adopted two resolutions relating to boulevard parking and beautification. Subsequently, staff from Public Works, Engineering and Bylaw met to discuss the contents of those resolutions and provide options for moving forward. Next slide. For the purpose of this report, uh, we just wanted to note that Boulevard refers to the area between private property line and the curb were present or were not present the edge of the live traveled portion of the road. Next slide. Boulevard parking and beautification is regulated currently uh, by the parking bylaw 2003-062 and road occupancy bylaw 2018-031. Uh, both of these bylaws have been identified by staff as requiring updates in 2022 through the operational plan, uh, which is beneficial to the outcome of this report and provides good timing for implementation of any outcomes following Council's direction. Next slide. Uh, should be recognized by staff and Council that this report is not intended to be an in-depth review of parking design standards or larger initiatives, but rather provides option for the commencement of a phased in long-term boulevard beautification and no parking program. Next slide. As boulevard beautification is generally allowed under today's current ROP bylaw or road occupancy bylaw, the options being presented focus primarily on boulevard parking. So option one is status quo and requires no further changes to either bylaw. Uh, staff would continue to enforce existing bylaws as per current practices and policies, which can be enforced based on current staff resources. Staff are not opposed to this option. Next slide. Option two is a town-wide pro prohibition on boulevard parking. This would require updating the parking bylaw uh, to move forward as a starting process. It would also require significant dedicated resources to development, to develop an implementation and communication plan. It may create many additional complications within the community and would most likely receive strong community criticism and would require an increase to existing staff levels for the proper enforcement. Should Council wish to pursue this option further, staff are suggesting that resource needs and implementation approach be assessed and be presented back to Council at a future time. Next slide. Option three is a phased in approach, which establishes a long term vision and phased in approach to achieve an environmentally sustainable, beautiful, and naturalized boulevard system. 
This option is being supported by staff as it recognizes the community's strategic plan and vision for beautiful and safe spaces. It also provides a transparent mechanism to address individual needs and circumstances as they arise throughout the process. Option three proposes that the bylaws be updated uh, to allow for commencement of no parking on boulevards within areas of the town that currently have a designated um, or proper boulevard area and curb present. Further from that, as streets become reconstructed through the town's capital program, it would then fall into the bylaw where enforcement of no parking would be permitted. This option also provides and proposes a parking boulevard permit process to address unique situations which may result um, from mobility, disability, or simply due to uh, property layout and reduced widths. This approach through option three will commence and set the framework for Boulevard beautification program within the town of Collingwood. Next slide. Happy to answer any questions as it relates to the contents of the report or anything within this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Manager Cole. Uh, Deputy Clerk Dahl, would there be any members of the public who wish to comment or ask questions? Chair Hamlin, if there's anyone in our attendees list who wishes to speak to this item, please press the raise your hand feature at the bottom of your screen. And there's no one wishing to address this item at this time. Thank you. I'll read in the recommendation that staff report PW 2022-09 Boulevard parking and beautification update be received and that council support option three contained herein and that staff bring forward for council's consideration the necessary amendments to the existing bylaws, including parking and road occupancy bylaws to include the recommended changes as contained in option three. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Jeffrey. Councillor Doherty, thank you. Uh, would this, uh, okay, Councillor Jeffrey. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I support um, staff's recommendation. I think it's a, a good way of dealing with it. My question, and I know we've already spoken about them this evening, is um, an option where um, we could encourage people to use the permeable uh, paving that has the, um, is designed so that uh, grass or ground cover can grow through it. So you kind of achieve both. You still allow the resident the opportunity to park on the boulevard, but it's done in a way that is um, still going to meet our um, environmental and climate uh, challenges that we have. So um, I was just wondering if that fit into this option in some way. And when there's any opportunities for us to lead as a municipality, because I just, you know, we shouldn't ask people to do what we're not willing to be doing ourselves. So that's the one question I had. Thank you. Manager Cole, could you answer that? Through Madam Chair to Councillor Jeffrey. Under the current proposal, um, when a resident were to apply for what we consider the new Boulevard parking permit, they would also be required to obtain a road occupancy permit. And that's where the road occupancy bylaw comes into play. Under that bylaw, we would allow uh, and be able to provide the restrictions and accommodations necessary for the boulevard parking, which would be subject to um, our request as a municipality, which could include low impact uh, permeable surfaces, um, other things such as time of year, location, and, and all of those other aspects. Any follow-up, Councillor Jeffrey? No, other than just to make sure I don't need to provide any direction or amendment that we include that in, in the option. Sounds like Manager Cole's got it covered, but I think it's up to you. That's great. I'm leaving it with staff. I'm happy with that. Uh, any other comments or questions? Councillor Doherty? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I had a couple of comments and questions. Um, 
first of all, I, I, I admit I was looking um, forward to uh, something more immediate and more definitive uh, than what is in front of us this evening. Um, that said, I do appreciate uh, some of the complications uh, relative to where people park. Uh, especially when there is not adequate parking. Um, so uh, I, you know, I can, I can support the uh, option three, um, but I do have a, just a couple of questions in that regard. Um, so the first would be, um, you're saying this is a uh, long-term project uh, and long-term vision by long-term, how long? do you mean? Manager Cole, can you answer that question? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I will take the first attempt to answer that question and, and look to my peers for some support. But essentially, we're, we're saying it's a long-term uh, vision because of the capital program. Um, today's streets that have a, a true boulevard are, are mainly our newer subdivisions, our newer developments. So when we look to areas of town, such as the, the older tree streets, the downtown area, um, as they become urbanized, as they become constructed through our capital programs is when they would actually have a, a boulevard created with a curb that meets the definition of the bylaw and thus form part of that process. So it's truly dependent on how fast our capital programs come forward through annual budgets. Yes, I think Director Slama has a response as well. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chair Hamlin. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, Manager Cole spoke well, um, and I would agree, like the long-term aspect is, you know, we can through these changes in the bylaw, you know, we can create the vision of the boulevard moving forward, right? And, and as we look at, you know, developments happening, we can make that a standard, right? But it's, it is the, it's the, um, you know, changing what already exists and, and, you know, being realistic about that. Um, and the, you know, as um, manager Cole said, really the, the best time to do that is when we're looking at these major capital uh, projects that are looking at a road reconstruction and changing that uh, cross section of the street. So, you know, to change um, some of the well established neighborhoods, I think there, uh, there will be a bit of time. The, the short answer is I, I don't think we have a definitive end date, uh, but maybe as we look uh, towards these bylaws, we can work towards, we can think of this, you know, we can consider your question and, and think or contemplate if we can set a timeline, if it's realistic for us to set a timeline to it. Um, yeah. uh, yes, please, um, because you've led me uh, quite well to my second question. And, um, and that is why are we uh, differentiating between curbed and not curbed uh, because in actual fact I'm, I'm mo it, it appears to me anyway that most of the parking on boulevards is being done on those streets where there are no curbs and so uh, if we go by this standard that's not going to be addressed at all uh, in fact, it seems to me that curbs are somewhat of a natural deterrent uh, because it requires the, the vehicle to be moved up over the curb to get onto the boulevard. Uh, so um, why make that differentiation? I mean, there is no functional difference between the two and there's certainly no visual um, impact between the two. Or no visual difference in impact, sorry. Director Slama? So I think, thank you, Chair Ham, through you to Councillor Doherty. So I think if you're asking, can, you know, as a comment, right, can there be consideration, uh, you know, as we work through these bylaw amendments to, 
to um, create some standards for like the curved and the non-curved cross section. I think we can look at that. Yes, um, I, I, I for one uh, would be very supportive of that. Um, and I'll have to read the resolution again, um, but I also will add it as an amendment if it's not there, um, that we should be looking at both uh, both um, uh, forms of uh, parking. Mm -hmm. um, my next question is... Um, so, excuse me, sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, Chair Hamlin, I just saw that Manager Cole had his hand up, so I didn't know if you oh, just wanted to add on to that you. item. Not, um, okay, go ahead, Manager Cole. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Just for a point of clarity uh, to Councillor Doherty, before Council is option two, uh, within the report that does not distinguish between curb or no curb. It is a complete townwide uh, prohibition of boulevard parking. So I just want to uh, point that out again for council's consideration. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, thank you, uh, Manager Cole. So I do, I, I do buy into the notion of allowing some time to uh, review the bylaws. Uh, but on the other hand, I also, uh, speaking for myself anyway, uh, would like to see a townwide prohibition as opposed to just on the curb street. So I don't know if we can marry these two or not, um, but that would be just, again, speaking for myself, that would be my preference. Um, the uh, next question I have is, uh, there are a number of areas around town where residents have paved the boulevard. And uh, are we going to require that paving to be removed? Uh, Manager Cole, would that be an answer for you? Thank you, Madam Chair. If I actually may defer to my colleagues. Go ahead, uh, Director Slama. Thank you, Chair Hamlin. Uh, through you to Councillor Doherty. Uh, I think we, I don't, I think we don't have a definitive answer for that yet. Uh, but I think that is, you know, we can, I can say that that is something we're considering, right? When we're looking, when we're looking at the the road occupancy permit changes, bylaw changes. Right. And CEO Skinner, did you want to add uh, into that as well? Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you as well to Councillor Doherty. Uh, I think everybody in the new, um, it, it, should you accept the proposal of the two updated bylaws, uh, the description of one of the updates is that uh, should you uh, wish to park regularly on a boulevard, um, that you would require a road occupancy permit and a permit to do so. So I think at each case, we would be able to look at what people have have uh, have placed there um, and if they had the appropriate approvals to do so at the time. So I think each uh, each case we'll need to look at as the permits uh, work their way uh, through town. So to be clear, we would not be asking for uh, permits today. We would only be asking as we um, implement updated bylaws. Who would like to answer that? CEO Skinner, go ahead. Give it a, a try and then uh, uh, I know Manager Cole has been quite close to this. I think for the last number of years there have been good records kept around uh, uh, approvals to park uh, seasonally or, or longer term on boulevards, but that hasn't always been the case. So I, I would say that uh, we don't have a comprehensive uh, list of all of the historical approvals um, or, or people who have consistently been parking on boulevards throughout the town, uh, but do for the more recent ones. Any follow-up? Uh, okay, so no other comments on, on that. Um, my final uh, question uh, is, um, Actually, um, and it's actually consistent with what uh, Councillor Jeffrey asked was if we 
provide permits. Uh, and if as part of that, we uh, require that the boulevard be uh, paved in some way so as to avoid um, mud or deep tire tracks or in interference with town trees, um, that we, um, as part of that paving, that it should be some kind of permeable surface. So that was a good get, Councillor Jeffrey, and uh, totally agree. Um, okay, uh, will we uh, have a public meeting or will we offer the opportunity for a public meeting? Because it, it seems to me that public input would be important here. Director Slama, is that your answer? for this. Thank you, Chair Hamlin. Through you to Councillor Doherty. So typically when we go, uh, you know, when we have bylaw amendments, um, they are they are obviously brought through committee and, and council and there's an opportunity for the for the public to comment during that. Um, uh, yeah, in that situation. Uh, so I guess at this time, we, uh, we haven't considered an extra consultation to the public, uh, but it might also depend on the recommendation of the changes to the amendment. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, a deputy clerk, uh, or I guess I, if I could, I would like to put forward an amendment then to the recommended option um, that uh, it, the recommended changes uh, in option three would include a, a town-wide ban or, or review of a town-wide ban on uh, boulevard parking. Okay, uh, would there be a, are you making a motion now? Uh, yes, because I, th I, uh, I don't think that, that um, it otherwise um, captures, well, my intent anyway. Um, if it needs to be an amendment, then the committee can vote on it for sure. Okay, well, I'll come back for a seconder uh, in just one minute. Uh, would there be any other comments from the committee before we deal with this? Okay. Um, so, uh, would there be a seconder? Yes, Council CEO Skinner. Um, thank you, Chair. I uh, I would just point out there. I believe there is an option in the report. It's option two, um, which talks to uh, a bull a bull a ban on boulevard parking. Um, it, it does briefly uh, talk about that uh, option. And uh, one thing that we would suggest to decision makers is if you are contemplating um, that as uh, your preferred option, uh, depending on the seconder in a vote, um, is that the instruction be to staff to uh, please come back with uh, the implications uh, because we did feel that if that was to be implemented in the short term, there were some uh, uh, significant um, uh, human resource uh, considerations that we should put in front of decision makers first. Thank you. Thank you. So, Councillor Doherty, did you want to propose option two, or are you? Uh, well, no. As I as I indicated earlier, I I could I could support the notion of a phased implementation, but I would um, like like to recommend that the implementation be a town-wide ban and not just on um, the curbed uh, roads in our community. So it would be, in my view, unless I'm reading this wrong, this would be a combination of option two and option three. Okay, would there be a seconder uh, for that? Okay, seeing none, uh, that's, uh, I think now we're down to voting on the um, recommendation before us, unless there's any other um, motions to amend. 
No, okay. So with respect to option three, which is the, the recommendation on the staff report, all those in favor and opposed. And thank you, okay. All right, that's it for our staff reports tonight. Uh, the next item is 8.2, which is the Collingwood Heritage Committee meeting minutes of December 7, 2021. Uh, the, I'll read in the recommendation that the minutes of the Collingwood Heritage Committee meeting held December 7, 2021 be received and the recommendation, recommendations contained therein be approved. Could I have a first a mover and a seconder for the minutes, please? Councillor Jeffrey, Mayor Saunderson, thank you. Would uh, any member of the Standing Committee have any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favour? Thank you, that's unanimous. Uh, the next item on the agenda is our consent agenda. I'm going to read in the recommendation. The council here and receive the general consent agenda and further that the information and opinions provided in the general consent agenda items are that of the authors and are not verified or approved as being correct. So 9.1 is NVCA media release, Marion McLeod and Gail Little to continue to lead 2022 NVCA board of directors. 9.2 NVCA board meeting highlights, January 28, 2022. 9.3, Bob Tyson, initial tree canopy threshold for development. And 9.4, Fontour International Inc, proposed 40 meter Signum wireless telecommunication tower, and that's for 879 6th Street. Could I have a mover and a seconder for the consent agenda, please? Mayor Saunderson, Councillor Jeffrey, thank you. Uh, and now I'll uh, ask for the vote on the agenda. All those in favor? I'll come to uh, discussion in a moment. Yeah, okay, thank you. And then would any uh, member have any items they wanted to pull for discussion? And that's Councillor Doherty and Councillor Jeffrey. Okay, Councillor Doherty, go ahead. Uh, 9.3 and 9.4, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, three. And Councillor Jeffrey? 9.1. 9.1. Okay, let's start with Councillor Jeffrey, 9.1. Go ahead. Uh, just really easily just to say congratulations to Councillor McLeod on her continued leadership at MVCA. I'm not sure if we've had the opportunity to recognize that at council, which I'm sure the mayor would do, but um, just through this committee wanted to congratulate her because a lot of their good work and information comes through our committee. So appreciate having her, her there and in their leadership role. Thank you. Okay, thank you for mentioning that. Okay, 9.3, Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you. Um, so this uh, item is uh, from a resident uh, who has been uh, very active uh, in his community uh, in efforts to um, soften the impact of development as much as possible, uh, and in this particular case, uh, tree preservation. And um, he does have uh, an interesting concept here. And so I wanted to uh, um, bring it to the attention of uh, our planner and uh, just um, get her um, observations on the uh, possibility of considering this as part of our planning and uh, zoning bylaw process development. Okay, is there anything in particular or I guess Director Valentine, you're familiar with this correspondence? Okay, over to you. Uh, yes, I certainly am, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Councillor Doherty, for the opportunity to speak to this item, and thank you also to Mr. Tyson for sharing his thoughts uh, with staff, both in a letter and a follow-up conversation uh, that we had with him. Uh, the genesis of his letter is relating to an existing provision in the Towns Urban Design Manual that does require, um, as a guideline, 30% of tree cover on any given site, but that tree cover is measured at maturity. And what Mr. Tyson is proposing is a different approach, uh, which would be, um, and I think he's just throwing it out as an example, a 20% tree retention of mature trees on any given subject property, um, of course, with potentially some flexibility for unusual circumstances. 
Um, so these comments land at a very good time because while certainly staff do as a best practice recommend tree retention and preservation uh, planning through the uh, regular review of development applications, um, this type of change within the urban design manual does merit a wider community consultation and can certainly be incorporated in both the review of the official plan, which may have um, some overarching policies to consider with respect to tree cover, and then more specifically through the urban design manual. So we did uh, obtain permission from Mr. Tyson to share his comments with the consultants that are currently working on those products. And uh, we've also encouraged him to participate as well in any of the upcoming public engagement opportunities once the official plan and uh, following that the urban design manual is released. So all, that all to say is uh, your comments have been heard. They do land at the right time in terms of the comprehensive review of these documents and we look forward to discussing the ideas with the community at large. Okay, thank you for that answer. Uh, any follow-up, Councillor Doherty? No, I appreciate that answer and uh, I'm very glad that this is coming forward at, at a very good uh, time. So Yes, uh, Deputy Clerk Dahl. Uh, thank you, Chair Hamlin. I do have uh, Mr. Tyson in the audience and he has raised his hand, so I don't know if he would allow him to speak briefly to this item or not. Yes, I think now would be a good time. Thank you. Mr. Tyson, would you like to go ahead at this point? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? We can. Okay, super. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. And I, I just gotta say this uh, meeting has been very educational. Uh, on a totally separate topic, I think you guys should somehow educate the town on what you do uh, with each of your committees and and staff and the uh, the extent of, of things that you cover. I think it's uh, it's been a, a real eye opener for me. Okay, well, thank you. We'll uh, we'll, we'll get on that. Yeah, uh, spread the no, word <laughs> to, to the topic. Um, the initial tree canopy coverage. Um, the, the point where, uh, you know, Summer and I have, have maybe disagree is, uh, is that right now there is no, the mature tree canopy coverage is not, is not adequate for approving site plans today. And I would like you guys, I don't know how, because I'm, I'm not a politician and I don't know the laws, but I would like you guys to uh, implement this as an interim process until the official plan and the zoning and, and all that stuff, uh, you know, gets worked out and gets public, um, you know, public input, et cetera. Because Honestly, I don't think anybody in the town of Collingwood would be opposed to this except for the developers. And it, it doesn't have to be tree retention, but the developers, before they get um, uh, an occupancy permit, they would have to demonstrate a 20% tree canopy. So I, I, I don't care how they do it, whether they retain the trees or whether they plant mature trees or whatever they do, I don't care, but but from a planning point of view, they would have to demonstrate 20% uh, initial tree canopy coverage before they could get uh, occupancy. So that's all I wanted to say, thank you. Okay, thank you for those comments. Uh, that's very helpful. Uh, any follow-up, Councillor Doherty? No, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, would anyone else like to comment on this? Uh, I, I would like to say something, and I, I know where Mr. Tyson's coming from, because once our interim control bylaw gets lifted, uh, I think we can all appreciate we could be, again, facing situations uh, more regularly where trees are coming down more than, you know, we would like to see as a community. And whether our standards should be changed uh, or not, if we're waiting for urban design guidelines, I'm guessing, and maybe Director Valentine, this is a question I have for you. When, when, would, when would we possibly see that discussion in the community? Uh, thank you, Chair Hamlin. So I think the discussion can start as part of the official plan review because that does ultimately set the policy stage for the urban design guidelines. 
Uh, the consultant is currently also working on an update of the urban design guidelines, um, but uh, we did want to bring the official plan forward first, have that conversation, and any policy guidance that would then impact the content of the urban design uh, guidelines could come afterwards. And plus, we're also very mindful that both of these documents are 100 page plus and to, uh, to, to try to have a conversation with the community on both of them at the same time uh, seems a bit overwhelming. Uh, but certainly we do believe that a community conversation is warranted, including the development community in terms of major changes of this type to our urban design approach. Okay, thank you. I, I think it's worth saying uh, that trees are so important to the community. We don't have enough tree canopy now, as I recall our urban forest management plan saying, and we expect to lose a lot of it because of a disease that's currently going through a certain uh, type of our tree. So I wanted to, to say when, you know, well, let me ask you this question, if I may. Um, do you know when our official plan, the draft will be released for the community to have a look at and council? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The draft is targeted to be released at the beginning of March for council's consideration. And if council feels that the version is uh, suitable to start public consultation, uh, then they would provide council uh, staff with that direction at the time. Okay, so I think what, I, what I'm gonna suggest at this point uh, is I think we'll wait, for me at least, I'm content to wait until that document's released. Uh, and then we'll see what's in the document and perhaps uh, the, it'll be warranted uh, bringing the question of trees on development sites back uh, for a policy change, if necessary, uh, before uh, before we wait for the end of the whole process. So anyway, those are my comments. Um, so uh, if there's none other, oh, uh, Mayor Saunderson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just going back to our urban uh, tree canopy report, my recollection is that we were at about 36% uh, canopy coverage, which was above average. And I'm wondering if any of our uh, staff are able to confirm that um, for us. Uh, just, uh, just in follow up to your comments, uh, because mm -hmm. my understanding was we, we are in quite a good place, but uh, we need to be mindful and diligent in sustaining that moving forward. Um, but that we were starting from a place that was um, quite positive. And I don't know if there's any staff that could comment on that. See you, Skinner. Thank you, Chair. Through you, um, I uh, I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, and the directors uh, who uh, who are very familiar with this are, are not on the line tonight. But we'd be happy to uh, follow up and report back to the committee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is that all right? Is that uh, you, your question covered off at this point? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, next item on the agenda is departmental updates. And I see we have one listed here. Oh, okay, over to you, Councillor Doherty. So sorry, at 9.4, yeah. 9.4, I also oh. asked. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, 9.4 uh, is the response from Fontour uh, International. Uh, in regard to the uh, 40 meter um, uh, wireless telecommunications uh, structure uh, to be uh, built on 6th Street. And um, I had asked uh, for uh, consideration to be given to um, um, camouflaging that tower better uh, than in what is uh, uh, what was in the proposal. And I had uh, suggested a couple of options, including a uh, monopole design or a um, evergreen design. And uh, their response back um, basically indicated that um, based on the technology that was required, that uh, neither one of those options uh, was feasible. Um, so I accept that. Um, I hope generally that um, as these applications come forward and as the technology and uh, 
design considerations change and improve that we will be brought forward with the uh, best looking uh, signs uh, and uh, least obtrusive signs uh, in addition to, um, not signs, um, um, structures. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, structures. Um, the other uh, suggestion that they made was uh, they, they did propose that they would put uh, panels on the structure and they suggested that they could put the calling with logo on those panels. And uh, I thought that that would be a terrific idea. Um, considering that that is, uh, you know, coming into the built up portion of our town. Anyway, um, so I'm just wondering how we could proceed uh, with um, making that request of them, assuming that council agrees. So I believe that uh, to get some direction or an, uh, out of an item on a consent agenda, we would need a notice of motion. Yes, Mayor Saunderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we also have this item on 12 under other business. So perhaps uh, Councillor Doherty, if she wants to put an amendment on the floor, could do so at that point in time. Okay, I will do that. That's fine. Thank you. All right, any other comments on the consent agenda item? Seeing none, departmental updates. And we have manager Kenny here this evening to give us an economic development education. Good evening. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity. I believe a presentation is popping up. Excellent. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I will be brief. Um, wanted to come to council and our committee and give a, a brief update of our 2021 activities. Look forward a little bit to 2022 and refresh everybody's mind as we go into a new year of the mandate and activities of economic development. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to start most of my presentations with this. You know, our, our mandate is really local jobs and investment, and that's where the rubber hits the road. We want to retain and expand those local businesses. That's where three quarters or more of job creation comes from. Uh, we certainly want to encourage our new entrepreneurs to start businesses, and we're, we're quite successful at that. And we want to attract existing businesses and entrepreneurs from elsewhere. Largely for us, that target market is the GTA. Uh, we also want to put businesses and investors into the best position to succeed, and we do that in a variety of ways, and we have quite a bit of control over that at the local government level through infrastructure policy and programming. Next slide, please. So uh, a reminder, we do have an action plan. We're in year two of a, a five-year strategy. Uh, we do have three goals, so to go over them quickly, we want to make Collingwood a hub for sustainability innovation, and many of the things that we want to highlight have been talked about this evening. Uh, we want to promote Collingwood as a great place to live and work. And we certainly want to ensure that Collingwood is investment ready. Next slide, please. So what I want to start off with is really what I would um, emphasize is our core program, which is the Small Business Enterprise Center. And if we were to strip everything back from economic development and we could only do one thing, this is the one thing that I would suggest we do. So as a reminder, this is a regional program that is um, funded very significantly by our provincial partners and also by our regional uh, governments that surround us. Um, and they do a variety of programs, some that we've highlighted here, including grant programs, which is a flow through from the province and the total of $72,000 to help young entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs over 30 to start new businesses. Uh, we have our wonderful digital Main Street program, uh, which has over 200 consults in the last year alone. Uh, and that allows for uh, digital marketing support, website support, e-commerce support for entrepreneurs and, and businesses in our community. Uh, we have supported events. Uh, the one primary event was the Accelerate Summit, which is a, a digital event this year. Had over 300 attendees uh, supported through our Small Business Enterprise Center. Uh, and, you know, if, if you look at it every day, including holidays and weekends, we did two consults every single day. Um, and that was at a minimum. Um, there are, you know, interactions that go on that aren't necessarily considered a consult. These are the numbers that we report to the province. And so we have to talk to somebody for 30 consecutive minutes in order to count it as a provincial consult, 
we're often fielding those phone calls and those five minute chats in the hallway or somebody pulls us off the street and, and we're having those conversations as well. Next slide, please. Uh, a quick update on the Small Business Accelerator. Um, as a reminder, it's high-end mentorship and access to capital. That's really the name of the game here. And we wanna target those businesses in South Georgian Bay that can grow and scale quickly. And we took several actions last year and we'll continue them into this year. Uh, the fiscal year for the accelerator goes until March 31st of 2022. Uh, there will be a report incoming from the accelerator directly to council in Q2, uh, where they will report on the actions of the first year, and they will be likely requesting uh, the additional contribution that is included in the initial resolution from council. Uh, we did recruit a board member as uh, was allocated in, in December of 2021. And we did sign the memorandum of understanding with the board. So there is, there is an understanding between the town our contribution, where it goes, and then the accelerator itself. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna highlight various projects, not an exhaustive list, but I'll go very quickly through them on, on what we've done in 2021 and continue for the next year. And data is critical for economic development, for site selection, for investment attraction. And so, you know, under the leadership of our CAO, who is a, a bit of a data hound herself, um, we have led um, multiple data initiatives uh, in 2021 and will continue next year. Our community profile, which was highlighted at a previous council meeting, which has been downloaded countless times, and we use it in business planning actively through our Small Business Enterprise Center. We've also launched a data dashboard, which is still in its initial phases, but really targeted at those site selectors, at those developers, landowners, investors that are seeking out, you know, calling what is an alternative to big city lifestyle or big city development and looking for, you know, new commercial space, new industrial opportunities and, and mixed use opportunities. Next slide, please. Uh, the biggest thing for us is really information sharing. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we instituted in 2021, we went from a quarterly newsletter to a weekly newsletter. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the amount of people on our, our mailing list, over 50,000 potential touch points are possible. Uh, we expect to double that over the next year to over 100,000 with our entrepreneurs and, you know, people from the GTA or people considering a calling what is the location to do business. Um, and one of the biggest things in COVID and one of the biggest things that we responded to COVID with is that flow of information, which often changed on a weekly basis and did change today, in fact. So, we still continue that flow of information into the community as, as we go. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the biggest things we're investing in is lead generation, the infrastructure behind it. We have a CRM, uh, customer relationship management software. We're nurturing our leads over time. They don't just come into our center and then we never talk to them again. Uh, we've automated a lot of those systems and still providing that personal service, but we are looking to market various activities, programs and events that we're running we market these locally, 24-7, 365, come on in, either the Business Development Center or virtually, uh, and we'll provide you with service. Or, you know, we've targeted some GTA entrepreneurs as well. And one of the examples is an ebook we created that's called The Top Four Pitfalls to Avoid When Moving Your Business Out of the GTA. And it positions calling what is a natural alternative for them. Next slide, please. Uh, I won't focus too much on this because we did a separate council presentation, but we did have the Discover Collingwood app that launched last year, as well as our Main Street Modernization Program. Uh, this will continue to expand and be maintained in 2022, uh, and there will be a ramp up of marketing as we get into the warmer months and we get people scurrying about in the downtown streets and doing the various walks and tours. Next slide, please. One of the ways that we really wanted to step up our game this year was through celebrating business successes. Um, we had these wonderful paddles made that I think is pretty representative of the community uh, that we're giving out at grand openings, anniversaries, and other you know, business uh, engagements. Uh, we'll continue to do that in 2022 and beyond, and, and we're really happy with the feedback that we've seen initially from, uh, from those that have received it. Next slide, please. We're also creating wonderful content and highlighting our local business community. We want to celebrate their successes, and there's a couple or a few that, were, that are highlighted here, the Summit Social House. First Bike Cafe, I, I believe in Ontario. Um, Side Launch, obviously a wonderful brewery and Share Organics, a, a wonderful local Main Street business. We did about 20 of these. We try to do one every couple of weeks uh, on and off, but we're looking at evolving our content this year. We want to talk more about sustainability and the green economy. We want to talk about social enterprise. We want to talk about all the wonderful developments that are coming to our community. So you'll see a, a much wider array of, of content. And we use this to A, highlight our local businesses, but then B, we use these as case studies for people that we're looking to attract to the community as kind of a see yourself here opportunity. Next slide, please. 
And we are very pleased to announce uh, publicly that we have been uh, nominated for two provincial awards for economic development in the past year. Uh, EDCO is the Economic Development Council of Ontario. And we are one of very few communities and punching well above our weight to be uh, have, have received multiple nominations. Uh, one is through our Small Business Enterprise Center, the Regional Digital Main Street Expansion Program. You know, Digital Main Street was given to various communities across the province. We expanded on it drastically and were able to provide a, a much higher level of support than many communities. And we were um, justified, I believe, in that nomination. And then our wonderful uh, Collingwood Patio Licious from the past years uh, was nominated as well. And we will be continuing that into 2022. Next slide, please. So to talk about 2022, just a couple of really quick slides to close. Um, some of our plans, we are looking at a business ambassador program, which is included in our strategic plan and looking specifically on how we can engage our local CEOs and business leaders to help engage our department heads and our leadership and council, but also help us on the investment attraction side and, and work with directly with entrepreneurs, business leaders from elsewhere that may want to consider calling what is their new home. We are going to be working on investment attraction packages as well aimed at site selectors in the real estate community, landowners, the development community. We really want to get people um, excited about the opportunities we have here. We, we have vacant land, we have employment lands, we have mixed use opportunities, affordable housing opportunities. We really want to put this in front of the right people. And we'll be doing a tourism ecosystem review. And currently we're partnered with South Georgian Bay Tourism. We do some work with Tourism Simcoe County and the RTO7, which is more of a regional body for Bruce Gray and Simcoe. We want to look at what that ecosystem looks like and really how can they focus on our key goals. We're seeing data from Gray County and elsewhere that says there are literally hundreds of thousands of visits. Our pie is very significant when you look at the amount of tourists, the amount of movement that's happening in our community. So how do we increase the spend per person? How do we give them better experiences? How do we create more products? Uh, so that's one of the goals that we have as well as sharing some information and doing training with our operators. And next slide, please. And as I said, we want to continue our, our award nominated uh, and hopefully award winning Patio Licious program into the next year and our craft beverage tour, which we have transformed from a couple of week event in the fall to something that's self serve all year long. We want people to uh, enjoy our craft beverage and, and some craft food industry as well. We've expanded that slightly um, and we have a really wonderful tourism product there that we want to focus on. We'll also be looking at, you know, we have an economic development portal that focuses on the Live More Now uh, branding. We want to continue that lead generation and focus on workforce development, which is a, a constant struggle in our community. Uh, remote workers, uh, looking at entrepreneurs and, and business owners, especially those home based, because uh, it's been a kind of a chronic problem across Simcoe County. We have a real lack of vacancy in our commercial and industrial sectors. So trying to focus on how do we still bring business here, but within the assets that we have currently as the development takes off. And we want to do a bit more of a GTA focus on the investment attraction side. And finally, another announcement. We are crossing the T's and dotting the I's, but we are very happy that the province will likely 98% certain be stepping forward with hundreds of thousands of dollars to continue supporting our Small Business Enterprise Center for years to come. Uh, and, you know, we've made the necessary investments council for a long time now has really invested in the small business enterprise center from a financial and a logistical sense. Uh, you know, we, we punch well above our weight, um, and we're really happy to continue that core service moving forward. And the next slide, I believe is the last one, and, uh, I'll leave it there for comments and questions. Thank you again for the opportunity. Oh, thank you very much, Manager Kenny. That was uh, so good to hear an update for uh, what you guys are up to. Um, so, uh, would any of the standing committee members like to ask any questions or have comments? And I see Mayor Saunderson. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and through you to uh, Manager Kenny. That is very good news about the Small Business Enterprise Center. We hopefully can get that agreement nailed down with the province. Uh, that will be a huge move forward, and um, and I look forward to receiving the accelerator report and finding out how our first cohort did. Uh, very excited about that, and congratulations to you and staff on the uh, two nominations for the EDCO Awards. Again, uh, all very positive stuff, and we're looking forward to the outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, any other comments or questions? No, nope. we all love what you said, Mayor Saunderson. So thank you for saying it. And thank you, Manager Kennedy, again. Uh, so
So the next item on the agenda is public delegations. And I just noticed uh, there was a note that Mr. John Welton wanted to address the committee. Is he still there or would there be any other members of the public? Uh, Thank you, Chair Hamlin. Uh, if anyone wishes to speak to the committee still, uh, please press the raise your hand feature at the bottom of the screen. And it appears they're shy now, so there's no one wishing to speak at this time. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, other business? Who would like to bring forward other business? Councillor Jeffrey and Councillor Doherty. Go ahead, Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to um, request a educational uh, piece for our committee uh, specific to the um, revised or updated procurement uh, bylaw that we have. I think it would be uh, informative uh, for our committee, so. All right, uh, Deputy Clerk Dahl, do we, need a, do we need a resolution in that regard or can staff work with that? What would be your suggestion? Oh, thank you, Chair Hamlin. I can invite the uh, manager of uh, procurement accountability and um, risk management to attend our next meeting under uh, department updates, if that works. Okay, yeah, that's great, thank you. Thank you. All right, Councillor Doherty, what would you, you have your motion? Uh, yes, thank you. And I um, apologize for the uh, premature summary of uh, this item. Um, however, uh, my motion would be, and I'm sure the deputy clerk can you can find better wording, uh, would be that uh, council um, approve the uh, proposal by Fontour uh, Fontour Communications. Uh, to implement a logo uh, on the panel of the 6th Street um, cell tower, cell tower, uh, with design, I guess, to be determined between economic development and communications. Okay, thank you. And uh, Deputy Clerk Dahl, can you remind me where, when would this be dealt with? Uh, thank you, Chair Hamlin. So there is a staff report and motion on this portion of the agenda as it was deferred from the January 31st first council meeting. Uh, so we'd have to first put the staff report on the floor and allow staff to speak to the report. Okay, just give me one minute here. It is listed under item 12. Okay, I'm dealing with something that wasn't updated. Okay, I do see it under item 12. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll, uh, I'll read this in and we'll, there'll be a staff report presented on this tonight. Deputy Clerk Dahl, is that correct? I see. Community Planner Tickle, this will be your job. Okay. Why don't you present your report? Thank you. Yeah, so I don't have a formal presentation prepared other than the, the presentation, unless you would like me to give the presentation that was given previously um, last month to this committee. Um, but the, the staff recommendation remains the same, um, that council receive this report uh, and that council approve a concurrence for the radio communications tower proposed at 879 6th Street to be provided to Industry Science and Economic Development Canada um, and if the committee wished, they could include with that um, that council approve the concurrence um, for a radio communications tower proposed at 879 6th Street, the inclusion of the town logo. Um, and then the applicant, the applicant has offered to include that, so I don't see them um, having any objection to that inclusion. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So is this a matter where we can decide on this tonight? We don't need notice and it goes forward to council. What would you recommend, uh, Deputy Clark? Yeah, that's correct. It would be an amendment to the motion provided by staff. 
Oh, okay, I, I, I understand. Okay, so would there be a seconder for Councillor Doherty's motion? Uh, sorry, Councillor Hamlin, did yes. you put the motion on the floor and get a mover and seconder yet? I don't believe so. Well, I'm just, uh, I- We need I to consider- Oh, the, the main motion. Yeah, we have to have the thank main you. motion on the floor right. first, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Could I have a mover and a seconder for the main motion, please? Mayor Saunderson and Councillor Doherty. Okay. And now we have an amendment that has been proposed by Councillor Doherty. Would there be a seconder for that amendment? Uh, I'm going to second it just to get it on the floor. Uh, Councillor Jeffrey, do you want to speak to this? Well, I should just say, Councillor Doherty, would you like to speak to it first? Uh, or would you have you said what you wanted to say? You're muted. Uh, yes, uh, certainly, uh, Chair, I'd be happy to speak to it. I just, I think that um, this is uh, a uh, wonderful offer uh, by the proponent, and I think it serves a number of purposes uh, for us uh, in terms of uh, marketing, uh, for our marketing and imaging. Uh, for our community and uh, will have no impact on the performance of um, that piece of infrastructure. So I, I just feel that this is really a natural. Okay, thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to comment on this motion? Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I think in a proposal where we're trying to uh, really get the best possible result that something doesn't stand out, but that it fits in, I find it strange that we'd want to make it stand out with our logo. And also, I think what we discussed at the last meeting was that um, it had already gone through public consultation. And I think to add this without that, I just, I really can't support it. My idea would be that it kind of blends into as they showed us in the diagrams and that we don't try to draw attention to it with our logo. And I'm not even sure what the readability of that logo would be from anywhere anybody would be seeing it from the roadway. I'm just, I, um, I just, I think what was originally proposed, I'm happy with the, uh, to vote on the concurrence, but I don't think we should be um, changing the uh, design. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Mayor Saunderson? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, just further Councillor Jeffrey's comments, by putting our logo on it, uh, it may lead me uh, many to believe that it's our tower, it's the town's asset, um, and like the water tower that has Town of Collingwood on it. And uh, so I wouldn't want uh, that confusion to be out there either. I think um, that uh, it's a telecommunications tower and uh, it's not the town's. And, uh, and I'm not sure it's an appropriate uh, vehicle for, for our branding, although I understand what Councillor uh, Doherty's um, referring to. It just seems to me in a, in, um, a, bit of a bit of a controversial place to be putting that. Uh, branding on. Okay, thank you. Any, any last comments? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, I certainly did not uh, see, if you look at the design that was supplied uh, in, in the letter back to us, it was certainly a very um, muted edition of the logo. Um, and uh, it was not going to change the color, shape, size of the panels at all. So you can have ugly panels or you can have ugly panels that, that at least uh, serve some purpose and complement the town. Um, and uh, there was also, um, speaking to the mayor's um, um, comments, the one of the logo options that was illustrated there was using um, the terminals uh, logo, uh, which is not an official town 
uh, logo, um, such as we use on um, the rest of our signage and communications. And so it would, in my view, be a nod to the town and to the terminals and to our heritage, as opposed to leading to any confusion as to uh, the ownership of the tower. Okay, well, I think we've had good discussion on that. Uh, all those in favor of uh, Councillor Doherty's amendment. Yes. <laughs> Okay, all those opposed. Oh, okay, that fails. And I believe we are now at the end of our agenda. I haven't missed anything, Deputy Perkall. That's it. No. So we're looking for you, sorry, sorry, Councillor yeah. Hamlin. You have to vote on the main motion of the staff report. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor? Okay, unanimous. Now for the adjournment. Councillor Jeffrey, thank you so much. All those in favor? And thank you everyone, that was a great meeting. Got lots done tonight, thank you.